June 17, 2021, meeting of the Federated City Employees Retirement System and Federated City Employees Health Care Trust. Uh, let's do the roll call. Um, Vice Chair Horowitz. Present. Thank you. Trustee Chandra. Not here yet. Trustee Jennings. Present. Thank you. Trustee Kelleher. Not here yet. Trustee Orr. Present. Thank you. And I'm here. So we have four members um, present and available. Let me um, start with the ground rules. And uh, for those of you who have been, haven't been keeping up, uh, despite the state's reopening, the um, uh, Brown Act components of the executive order <clears throat> are in place still September 30th. Um, so we have at least a couple more meetings of, of that. Um, so all votes will be roll call votes. If you are speaking, please be on mute. Uh, excuse me. If you are not speaking, please be on mute to cut background noise. For discussion items, each trustee will have a turn to speak in roll call order more than once if desired. The public will have an opportunity to speak on each item after trustees. The public will also have an opportunity to speak again at the end of the meeting on any other item not on the agenda that is within the subject jurisdiction of the board. Um, let's see, let's go out and move on to orders of the day. So we do have, um, it, it's already posted in the agenda. Uh, we do have a time certain at 1015 item 6C. Um, and then um, I'm also thinking, let's try to take a, our usual morning break just beforehand. So I'll look for an opportunity around the 10 or five time frame. We'll just keep going through the agenda, uh, maybe up until the 10 or five time frame. And then lastly, um, as usual, uh, there will be a recess from one, uh, one o'clock to 105 if you're still on to accommodate uh, Civic Center TV's broadcasting process. So um, Roberto, since all of that is already uh, baked into the agenda, do we need to approve the orders of the day? No, I think that just, you just want to keep everyone apprised as to you know, what are the orders of the day. There's, there's no approval needed. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. So uh, moving on to item one, the consent calendar. Uh, today's consent calendar consists of the approval of service retirements, approval of deferred vested, approval of board minutes, approval of return of contributions, acceptance of communication information reports, approval of travel conference attendance, approval of administrative matters, and, and that is it. Um, is there um, anything that needs to be pulled out of uh, any, any of you trustees want to pull anything off of consent? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, yes. I, don't, I don't need to pull any items, but I just want the trustees and the public in general to know that I stand ready to address item 1.7 if, if needed. Uh, I'm sorry, Roberto, could you repeat that one more time? Yes, uh, item 1.7 on consent. I don't yes. know. It doesn't need to be pulled, but just in case there were any questions, I am ready to address any issue. That's okay. All. Very good. Thank you. I would, um, anything from any, any other trustees? Uh, I, I would like to uh, note 1.1F. Um, the uh, It's very rare that uh, we see the city manager's retirement. Uh, come through on our agenda. Um, Dave, uh, it, it's been in the news. Dave is uh, retiring in July. Dave Sykes is uh, retiring in July. Dave, Dave Sykes is the city's 19th city manager. So we haven't, we've only had 19 of these come through the system. Well, not even that because our system didn't come in until later. And, uh, he's, it's uh, 19 city managers since 1916, I believe it is. Um, and, Dave has had a very um, uh, illustrious career with the city, I believe, in my opinion, um, serving as the uh, 34 years altogether, serving at one point as the director of public works before moving on to the um, role of city manager. So that is correct. I yes. acknowledge that. Um, 
So with that, um, I'd uh, entertain a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar today. I motion to approve. Okay. I second. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, motion by Trustee Jennings and a second by Vice Chair Horowitz. Let's do a roll call vote. Uh, Vice Chair Horowitz. Aye. Thank you. Trustee Chong. Not. Okay, trust. Trustee I'm sorry, Jennings. I didn't hear. Trustee Jennings. Aye. Thank you. Um, Trustee Kelleher. Not yet. Uh, Trustee Orr. Aye. Thank you. I also vote aye. That motion carries unanimously four to zero. <clears throat> Next, uh, going on to item two, is a report out of closed session. 2A report out of closed session from December 17, 2020, Federated Board. Uh, this is um, routine and that we do um, report out afterwards uh, from closed session. If there are no questions, I'll take a motion a second to um, approve item 2A. So move. I second. Okay, we have a motion from Vice Chair Horowitz and a second from Trustee Orr. Any discussion, no public discussion? Okay, let's do a roll call vote. Vice Chair Horowitz. Aye. Thank you, uh, Trustee Chandra. I'm sorry, I'm gonna read the names of, uh, of um, Trustee Chandra and Kelleher. Can I, uh, I do the participant list, but in the meantime, uh, Trustee Chandra, okay, Trustee Jennings. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Kelleher. Okay, Trustee Orr. Aye. Thank you. I also vote aye. That motion carries unanimously 4 to 0. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, item three death and survivorship notifications. At this time, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence for those who've served the city and have recently passed. Thank you, everyone. Item four, 4A is the oral update from the CIO Retirement Services, Mr. Pablo Polani. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a couple of things to inform the board before we move on to performance review from Makita and Newberger. Um, last Thursday, June 10th, uh, I had, the op had an opportunity to present to the Federated Retiree Association, and it was a good discussion. We spoke about asset allocation, why we are positioned the way we are, and we also spoke about performance. I briefly touched on uh, pension obligation bonds. Uh, of course, we don't have a lot of answers. Uh, we are still looking to our sponsor for guidance, uh, but I did encourage retirees to attend today's meeting, uh, particularly to hear uh, you know, Bill's superb presentation on pension obligation bonds, which will happen later this morning. Um, and then uh, performance, I have some performance numbers. Again, as always, these are preliminary unaudited numbers, and these are estimates. Um, as of June 15th, uh, fiscal year to date returns for the healthcare trust were 24.98%. And for the pension, it was 27.68%. Um, of course, we have nine trading days to go after today and anything can happen. Uh, in March, 2020, we lost 20% in 12 trading days. Hopefully it won't happen this time around and hopefully we have enough of a cushion. Don't jinx it, uh, Prabhu. <laughs> we, we, we've, had, we've had two negative days in a row, so I'm just being cautious. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully we have enough cushion to beat our assumed rate of return. And also, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, it is with great sadness that I have to report to the board that Brian Starr is leaving the investment team. And for personal reasons, uh, Brian has decided to uh, relocate to Europe. And uh, he has been with the plan for seven years and has been an integral part of our team throughout this time has been a big part of our transition to a more professional approach to managing our pension assets. 
And in the three, three plus years that I have been here, uh, Brian has been a close confidant and trusted partner in managing our pension assets. Um, I'd particularly like to point out his work ethic, which is second to none. Um, Brian put in long hours on behalf of our pensioners. Uh, we'll miss his sharp intellect, his dedication to our program and his work ethic. Uh, the city of San Jose has lost a dedicated employee, but we are grateful for his seven years. Uh, Brian has graciously agreed to stay on till the end of August as we search for his replacement. Uh, please join me in wishing him the very best in his future endeavors. I think we should have him work remotely. <laughs> Except the hours would probably be off, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I certainly tried every trick in the book. Uh, but yeah. um, I certainly respect his wish. Yeah. But, but he did give us uh, sufficient notice. And uh, some of you may have noticed that we do have a posting out for a senior investment officer. Mm. We've started receiving resumes and we've started reviewing them and Brian is part of the uh, interview process. That's good. So I'm hoping that as Brian transitions out, uh, hopefully we will have someone in that role. Mm -hmm. um, with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, if not, we can move on to item 4B. Um, Report on. Although, uh, I, yeah. I don't have any questions, but I, I did want to take the moment uh, to th thank you for letting us know about Brian. Um, yeah, that's a tremendous loss for the plan. Um, yeah, and, and um, I'm very happy for him. I, it's obviously a decision that he's making. I, I don't know the conditions of it, but uh, he's making the decision. He's doing what he feel, feels is right for him, and that. And I, I, um, yeah, I congratulate him on that. He will be a very tough replacement, um, and uh, and I, I'm, it's great to see he's also affording us every consideration possible by staying around, uh, help, helping with the um, process for uh, for his replacement. So, but thank you for letting us know. Congratulations to Brian, and best wishes to him. Certainly, uh, Mr. Chair. I mean, it's hard to follow uh, your comments and those of the CIO. Uh, he knows Brian best. Yes. Um, but I have the, uh, uh, you know, the luxury of actually working with him for the last seven years as well. And I just want to, on behalf of all the board members, on behalf of the staff, or more than anything, on behalf of the members of the plan, both plans, to thank uh, Brian. It's been a real pleasure working with him. And, um, you know, just to thank him for his hard work. And as Prabhu indicated, uh, amazing dedication and uh, amazing intellect and the great work he has done. And so uh, we want to thank him and wish him uh, the best. So he will certainly will be me. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Oh, there, there he is. I'd also like to echo everyone's remark and uh, thank Brian for his service. I'm, I'm not sure what Europe has that San Jose doesn't, but <laughs> I'm sure it was well thought out. All right, thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you for your kind comments, uh, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman and board members. And Brian's work is not done yet, as you shall see. He will uh, take over item 4B, uh, presentation of calendar fourth quarter private equity report. Uh, over to Brian and Casey. Okay, so I will share my screen here. And then I can hand it over to Casey to discuss the fourth quarter of 2020. Uh, private equity report. Great, thank you. Um, I will also pile on and just say we will miss working with Brian. Um, we count him as one of our, uh, you know, most educated and intellectual, uh, you know, intellectual people that we work with, and his his questions and. Um, uh, you know, conversations that I have with him weekly are uh, very much appreciated. So uh, we'll we'll miss that as well. 
Um, so uh, moving on to Q4, um, we have good news again this quarter, which is always a pleasure to report. Um, you know, starting out out 2020, definitely would not have expected um, the year that we have um, seen for 2020. Um, over the year, from the end of 2019 to the end of 2020, the portfolio was up around 27%. So um, throughout the year, Q1 2020 was the only slightly down quarter. Since then, each quarter has been up um, and Q4 was actually the strongest quarter of the year. Um, we've seen a lot of deal flow activity. We've seen a lot of um, not just, you know, potential transactions coming to the market, but a lot of investments closing. Um, and Q4 was definitely the height of that. And we've really seen that continue through 2021. So Q4 was um, up almost 14%. Um, this is the Q4 report. However, we are very far along um, on Q1 and we expect your portfolio for Q1 2021 to be up again um, over likely 15%. So really great development. Um, you know, we started this program four years ago, we're right kind of at the four year mark. We've stayed consistent in our deployment patterns um, in investing over vintage years. Um, and we're actually now in the process with your team of um, figuring out the next year. So year five, um, what exactly that will look like, but we'll continue with our same strategy of investing in primary funds, co-investments and secondaries. So the page you see here on page two, currently a net multiple of 1.4 times and a net IRR of 24.8. If you turn to um, page three, I won't go over all of this specifically, but pages three, four, and five highlight all of the underlying funds investment performance. And you'll see on the right how that actually quartiles against their peers. Pages four and five are the investments with the strategic partnership with Newberger. Um, very pleased with how these are performing so far. A lot of them, a majority of them are first quartile performers to date. We do have one um, that's a little slow out of the gate still um, needs to deploy quite a bit of capital. Um, so that one is not coming in as strong. We still have high faith in the GP um, that that will um, continue uh, to move forward and, and move up. But overall, um, very nice performance compared to um, peers. Page six, you'll see a little more information on how the portfolio is being deployed. So you'll see charts based on committed capital as well as invested. Committed is the investments that we have approved for your portfolio and that are legally closed into the portfolio. The invested is the pie chart there in the middle that shows of the amount we have committed, how much has actually been deployed and invested into companies or portfolio companies. So as you know, primary funds are deployed over time. So um, when you compare the committed to the invested, you'll see that the primary funds still have some more commitments or um, capital to deploy over time. So we would expect those pie charts to gradually um, move towards each other uh, once all the capital is actually committed and into the ground. Um, and on the far right side, you'll see not only the Newberger Strategic Partnership, but also your legacy investments and how they fit within the portfolio. 
Um, moving to page seven, page seven is um, a, a good overview of performance. One of the kind of most interesting uh, tables to look at is there on the top where we're showing the performance um, by investment type. So you'll see how each type of investment is actually producing for your portfolio. Um, secondaries and co-investments are very much utilized to help generate early strong returns. And you'll see that here where um, the, those are investments where the capital goes into the ground immediately. And so you really do tend to see that uptick quicker than some of the primary funds as they're still deploying and still investing and, and working with their companies to bring them to maturity and eventually exit. Um, I would say the primary funds being held at a 1.35 times four years into a program is actually very impressive. Um, so everything um, uh, with on this page, I think is exactly what we would expect. On the bottom, you'll see how your overall portfolio actually compares to peers. So not just on the underlying basis that we were looking at prior, but on the overall um, portfolio of, of the Newberger partnership, you'll see that um, on a quartiling basis, we are first quartile on a net TVPI basis, and we just barely missed the net IRR first quartile basis um, by about 0.4%, um, but hopeful that that, that will get up into uh, the first quartile here pretty quickly. Um, you'll, you'll see that um, all of this currently is being benchmarked off of your Q three numbers simply because the core tiling benchmarks are historically very late to produce um, core tiles. So we have to benchmark it um, a little bit um, uh, in the past. Um, and then page eight and nine, I won't spend too much time on, but this is just an overall view of the entire portfolio, um, including both legacy and Newberger. Uh, strategic investments, um, overall uh, portfolios performing uh, very well, the legacy currently being held at a 1.5 times on a great gross basis, and the new burger investments at a 1.4 times. So I will pause there and just open it up um, for any questions that anyone might have. I would also mention maybe that we are now at a point in time where we are starting to see some significant realizations out of the portfolio. So we do expect in the next quarters that we will be able to start distributing capital back um, to the fund. Um, so hopefully um, that exit environment will continue and um, we've seen some good developments to date. Thank you, Ms. Boyer. Questions from the uh, trustees? Yeah, great numbers. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Mr. Polani. Yes, Mr. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Casey. Um, so we will move on to uh, items 4C, D, and E. And for that, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Laura, Jared, and Makita. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. Um, my colleague, Jared Pratt, is going to start us off with the private market's performance. Thank you, Laura. Good morning, everybody. Uh, can everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Great. Yes, thank you. Good. Let's do a couple things here. Sorry. Um, so this is the private market uh, performance report as of the fourth quarter. Um, so this is the public version. We give uh, um, additional information to staff. Um, and then similar to Newberger Bor uh, Berman, this is as of the fourth quarter, so it's a little bit of a lag uh, as usual. 
So page two here has the snapshot. Uh, you can see a summary uh, of each account type. And if you look at the far to right columns, you have um, the plan's IRR against a public market equivalent. Um, so just to use real assets there on the bottom as an example, we would take the cash flows that are actually occurring in your real asset strategies and apply them um, to a public market index, um, in, in real assets case, a blend of a couple of indexes and just see how would those same investments have done on an IRR basis with the exact same timing of cash flows. Um, so that's essentially what the, the PME, um, that far right column is, is, is showing you a comparison of. Um, so you can see a favorable comparison in three of the five areas. Um, I would also note that if you look at this over the course of even one quarter, these numbers can change quite a bit, especially for the younger programs. So just keep that in mind. Um, and I'd also note that for private debt, there's some um, a drag from investments from prior staff that's having a, a pretty significant um, drag on the private debt aspect in particular. Um, on page three, we can go into each program in more detail. So this is private debt. Um, so this program is a decade old, is, is quite mature in the sense of actually being overweight its target a little bit. And also in the bottom left, you can see that it's mature in the sense of having um, full capital contributions. Uh, performance um, for this group of assets isn't as good as others, as I mentioned. Um, the, the IRR comparison is there on the bottom right. Um, but again, that's primarily due to some large 2010 um, commitments that, that just haven't done very well. Um, on page six, you can see the cash and return details strategy by strategy. Um, you know, so many funds committed by, by current staff have done well. And most notably, if you look at Arbor Lane 2, which is there kind of in the middle, um, it's got an IRR over 25%. Um, so quite impressive results there. And then on page seven, I would just highlight here on the top left that uh, vintage year diversification is a goal of the plan. And you can see that that is being accomplished uh, quite well here. Moving on to real assets. Um, so it's almost up to half of the target. You can see it's at 1.3% actual weight versus the 3% policy target. Um, and you know, a lot of attention is on this asset class now just with inflation uh, being kind of the topic uh, of the moment for sure. Um, the IRR of 5.2 uh, then on the bottom right is trailing peers, uh, but it is ahead of the public market equivalent. And it's also a program that's still building. And you can see that here on page nine where the blue bars are a lot more than the green bars, meaning contributions going to managers are quite a bit more than distributions coming from managers. Um, so just tells you that the program is still building up. Um, on page 11, again, we're looking at individual strategies here. Um, so there's been several commitments um, in the past couple of years, but none of them have meaningful performance um, yet, which is reflected in all of the NMs for, um, for not meaningful down here. Um, and then you can see that um, more than half of the total commitment was made in 2016. Um, and uh, it's only slightly trailing peers there. Uh, but, but certainly for the dollars involved, a, a big impact on the total. And then going on to page 13 with real estate, um, we're in near target here of 3.2% actual versus a 3% policy target. Um, if I go to page 14, um, you can see again that the program is in the part of the cycle where contributions are outweighing distributions. Um, so still building up. And then on page 16 with strategy by strategy, um, highlights you see several funds here i won't highlight anything in particular because there's so many uh, but the six percent irr here at the bottom is just edging out peers um, so the rest of the report is basically market overview slides of various private markets and in the interest of time i thought i would pause here and see if there's any questions jared jared um back on the on the real estate piece could you go back um to one more yeah so <clears throat> On this one, you, you noted that the um, contributions are still greater than the distributions. But I think on the prior slide, didn't you say the target was three, but we're already at 3.2? Yes, so the, ac the actual weight is higher than target. Um, and then, but there still are uh, a program that's, that's building. You can see some new funds, um, a couple of new funds here. But as far as contributions still ramping up, and it's not as um, outsized contributions versus distributions as was the case in real assets. Um, but I don't know, Laura, if you have any comments on or staff uh, on 
on the size of the plan and where it is um, in the cycle. Yeah, and, you know, as you know, we um, we put together staff puts together a pacing plan each year that's approved, and you know, it's it's a little bit difficult. And one of the reasons we update it annually is because you never know exactly when distributions or uh, capital calls are going to happen. And um, so, for a lot of private markets programs, you end up um, needing to to overcommit a little bit just to continually stay near that target, since the the mature funds are constantly giving you money back. Thank you. Um, any other questions on private markets before we move on to public or total fund, I should say? Yep, let's move forward. Okay. okay. Great, thank you. Um, so similar to um, Casey from Newberger and Prabhu's comments, we have good news to report, which is always um, uh, much more exciting to, to talk to you about um, than the flip side. But um, just to, uh, to lay the groundwork of um, what happened in the first quarter of 2021, I'll take a look at page four to start off. So it was a really strong quarter for risk assets. If you take a look at small cap um, equities, which is the Russell 2000, that top bar of almost 13% just in that three month period. So really pretty phenomenal numbers, followed by real estate investment trusts and then commodities, which rebounded quite a bit as well, up um, almost 7%. Um, broad US stocks were up over 6% for the three month period, ended March 31. You see there the Russell 3000 and S&P 500. Developed markets, non-US stop, stocks are the MSCI EFA up three and a half percent, emerging markets up 2.3, um, and high yield um, up almost 1%. We did have a rising interest rate environment during the first quarter. So you see um, negative returns for tips and investment grade bonds. Um, that situation has changed um, thus far in the second quarter and rates have normalized a bit um, and, um, and come back down. And we do have a positive return of over 1% for the aggregate index um, in the second quarter thus far. Um, if you take a look at the next slide, page five, you know, the thing that really stands out to me on this slide is those really incredibly eye-popping one-year returns. Um, if you take a look at, you know, for example, the Russell 2000, the small cap equity index up 95% for the one-year period, which is just incredible. <laughs> That's something that we, that we often see. And then I'd also point out for a long time, we looked at this slide and we showed you um, the dominance of growth stocks relative to value um, and large cap relative to small. And those trends have, have reversed a bit. And if you take a look, say, um, at the, uh, the 1Q returns for the Russell 2000 value, which is small cap value stocks, um, at the bottom of that first section there, up 21.2% for the three-month period, whereas growth stocks, small cap growth, the Russell 2000 growth, were up not quite 5% for that three-month period. And so, you know, I know over the last several years, we've gotten a lot of questions about why are we even holding value? Why do we have so much in small cap? Um, you know, and as you know, I've said before, you know, if you like everything in your portfolio at the same time, you're probably not well, well diversified. Um, and that's, that's proving true. You know, there is um, a long way to go um, for value to um, come back. If you look at, say, the three-year number for Russell 1000 growth versus Russell 1000 value, growth is still at double that value number. So there, there needs to be a ways to go, but um, we're glad that we had the value exposure in the portfolio recently. Um, I will mention that, you know, really the fundamentals um, and all of the numbers for the US economy look really strong. That's one thing that's leading to all these outsized returns. We have some charts that I won't go through in detail, but US GDP is incredibly strong. Um, unemployment numbers are now essentially back to, to where they were pre-pandemic. Um, and um, you see yesterday, the Fed um, mentioned that they would likely hold off on, on another hike until 2023, which I think that the market should um, interpret um, in a positive light. So with that um, backdrop, I will get into your fund specifically, which starts on page 24 with asset allocation. Um, so the value of the fund as of the end of March was 2.7 billion. 
Um, it had an increase of about 26 million from the end of the prior quarter that was mainly driven by investment gains. There was 75 million in investment gains during the quarter. There were outflows of 49 million. So that resulted in a net market value increase um, for the fund. Skipping to performance, we can look at um, the top level performance here and you see just incredibly strong numbers, both on a absolute and also a relative basis. So the net of fees performance for the quarter was 2.9% outperforming your policy benchmark and the investable benchmark portfolio, um, significantly outperforming the liability benchmark portfolio, which is a long, um, uh, long bond index and in a rising interest rate environment had very negative returns. Um, if you look at the peer group, the peer group also was very strong up 3.4%. If we look at the fiscal year to date and the one year, you do see um, a return right around the top third of that peer group, which is great um, also for the three-year period. Um, if you look down the page at, um, at returns relative to benchmarks, um, again, just eye-popping numbers for the one-year period with global equity up 64.2%, U.S. equity up 64% as well. So you're seeing a lot of um, uh, strong performance across um, asset classes. Um, the system did add three new investments during the quarter, Crestline co-investment in private real assets, Invesco core bonds in investment grade bonds, and um, Torchlight debt, debt fund in real estate. And then there was one termination within hedge funds, um, JD Capital. So I'll get into um, just highlighting um, a few individual managers here. Um, and if you take a look at page 29 and page 30, and we see the two artisan funds here, which are really, um, uh, really illustrate the, the difference between growth and value. So artisan global value up 9.7% um, for the quarter um, in the 17th percentile where, where one is the best in that peer group for the one year period up almost 70%. Um, continues to be a really strong manager in the portfolio. If you look at the since inception returns on the far right, you know, almost doubling the benchmark and in the top quartile of the peer group. Um, Artisan Global Opportunities, which is on page 30, is a growth manager. You can see that they struggled um, for the quarter, um, but if you look at the longer term returns, they have an even higher rank since inception since you hired them um, at 16th percentile and significantly outperforming the peer group, also outperforming the benchmark. So it's nice to have both that growth and value exposure in the portfolio, and those two funds are just uh, examples of that. Um, taking a look at Cove Street, Cove Street was on your watch list and is still on your watch list for, um, for and it has been for quite some time because if you look, their three-year and five-year numbers are still below the benchmark, but they've really um, uh, been a bright spot, especially on an absolute basis. If you look at their one-year return of 91.2%. So this is a really concentrated, um, not very many stocks in the portfolio. So it's pretty volatile, kind of goes along with our philosophy um, across your portfolio where we don't think it makes sense to, to pay active fees if you're going to have somebody who looks a lot like the, the index. So they do not look a lot like the index and luckily have come back in the portfolio recently. Um, just um, to use eye popping one more time on the next page, on page 31, if you take a look at Oberweiss International Opportunities, a return of 117% for the uh, one year period, um, which is in the first percentile of their peer group. So overall, um, I think looking through your portfolio, we could really highlight um, many really strong active managers. So in our opinion, um, the, the portfolio really is using active managers where it makes sense and asset classes where they can really add value and you don't have sort of benchmark huggers. Um, you have folks that are really taking, um, taking risk in the right ways. Um, so just to, um, to discuss a little bit on um, overall portfolio dynamics, um, if we wanna take a look at page 52, um, I'll skip ahead to um, the, the sort of um, peer relative return standard deviation and um, sharp ratios. Um, you can see for the one year period, um, the performance was um, better than median at 33.9 relative to 31.7. Um, the standard deviation was a bit higher than median. And this is really um, sort of a, a proof statement of what you all have been trying to do is to at least match the peer group. Um, and if you look over the longer term, um, the standard deviation is still below the peer group, but taking risk resulted in higher returns um, than the peer group median. 
So if we take a look at the next slide with the three-year period, you can see a return um, over a longer time period um, that is higher than the median at 9.4 relative to 8.9 for the peer median, a standard deviation that is lower than the peer group median at 9.5 relative to 10.6, and therefore a sharp ratio or risk-adjusted return um, that is uh, in the 29th percentile of the peer group. Um, so those, those are sort of stats that we'd like to keep an eye on to make sure that you all are accomplishing um, what you have set out to do. So we're happy to take any questions on, on the pension performance. Uh, just a quick question back on page 25 of the presentation, which is where you were showing sort of the top line result. Yes. Right. So uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that as successful as we've been and as successful as our active managers have been, it looks like the low cost passive portfolio has uh, outperformed our performance on both a quarterly fiscal and one year basis. So it would, it would be against type for me not to observe that. I uh, knew when you were going to this slide, but that's what you had mentioned and you are correct. It is a, a valid data point. Um, the one year return is uh, 20 basis points off and um, that one year return is, is net of all fees. The benchmark, you know, doesn't need to adjust for things like transaction costs or um, taxes or, or whatnot. So um, you are absolutely correct. Um, and it is something that we, we do keep an eye on over the long term. Thank you. Okay, um, should we move on to the healthcare? All right, so I will not um, rehash the market environment here. I'll just move right into the total fund, which starts on page 23. Um, so the value of the assets as of the end of March was 366 million. That was an increase of 11.3 million from the end of uh, calendar year 2020. And there were 0 0.3 million of net cash inflows and 11 million in investment gains um, for the quarter. Taking a look at performance, you can see here a quarter return of 3.1%, which ranked in the 10th percentile of the peer group, and a fiscal year-to-date return of 19.5, ranking in the top decile as well of the peer group, a one-year, excuse me, return of 32.7. Um, so if you recall, the peer group tends to be um, more conservative funds that are taking a bit less risk. Um, because of um, this fund's actuarial assumed rate of return being relatively close to that of the pension, this fund takes a bit more risk, and that was that was certainly rewarded um, in the current market environment relative to peers. Um, there weren't any manager terminations or additions during the quarter, um, and as you know, this fund um, uses a subset of the the more liquid sort of same managers um, that the pension trust does. Um, one difference is that this fund already had commodities in it. If you take a look at page 28, um, that, that um, allocation has remained here as it was sort of cycled in and out of the pension fund. Um, and the risk parity commodity uh, index for the one-year period was up 42%. Um, so not quite as strong as equities, but commodities have turned out to be a decent diversifier in this portfolio recently. With that, I'm happy to take any questions on the, uh, the healthcare trust. All right, thank you very much. We're crossing our fingers for um, a good next nine days in the market so that hopefully all of these gains are, are captured on an actuarial basis and continue to boost the fund. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Jared. Mr. Polani, anything else? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just was want to remind the board that, you know, this has been a very strong year, but our assumed rate of return going forward is still under 7%. So we shouldn't expect to see double digit returns or such strong returns in the years to come. Uh, in a way, the fact that we've had a 30 plus uh, percent return, but actually it's more like 27% so far, 
fiscal year to date means we are actually in some ways borrowing from the future. Uh, so just a note of caution there. Uh, also wanted to remind the board that uh, the city has, uh, as you all know, decided to uh, uh, pre-fund uh, contributions and we will be getting that amount on July 1st. And for the federated plan, that's roughly $200 million, 182 for the pension plan and 19 for healthcare trust. And uh, so we usually follow our asset allocation uh, in deploying those strategies, our existing asset allocation. And we also try to, we every quarter we rebalance our portfolios back to our target. And so we will use the, the inflow to help us with our rebalance and uh, save some transactions costs. Uh, that concludes the investment uh, portion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pawnee. Great information today. Yeah, I can imagine it's nice to present great numbers. <laughs> much, ni much nicer presenting great numbers like that. Thank you all. Okay, let's go on to item five is old business. We have none. Item six is new business. Five is oral update from the CEO of Retirement Services, Mr. Topania. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have to admit this is extremely hard to follow up with uh, comments <laughs> after Prabhu and his staff and the returns. Uh, he does this to me all the time, and uh, you know I'm glad for the plan, but I hate it. Uh, so, but he did promise me uh, three years in a row of double digits, uh, but he told me not to share that publicly, so I won't. Yeah. In any case, <laughs> um, do please bear with me. Um, I do have quite a while, uh, quite a lot to uh, update you on this month, being that this is the last meeting of the fiscal year. Um, and as I go through it, uh, again, bear with me. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. Um, uh, as I reported before at the last meeting, I believe you remember you received uh, the presentation by staff from the uh, new and improved website. Um, uh, it should be uh, going live uh, either later today or tomorrow. So I will follow up with uh, an uh, email communication to all of you, if not by tomorrow afternoon, by uh, Monday morning. It certainly will be one of the uh, lead articles of the newsletter in July. But suffice to say that it has been um, a challenging uh, effort by staff uh, through the pandemic. Uh, I do want to uh, publicly thank uh, the whole office and the IT staff on uh, putting and improving the, the website. And I think uh, if I can leave you with one thought as we go into this, this new and improved website is that I think as we uh, explained uh, during the presentation, this is really an ongoing process. We always strive to do better and improve it. So even as we go live, there's going to be some additions, adjustments, changes, uh, probably um, more early on than later on, but we also are going to be seeking for input from our members and you trustees. So as you see things that could be improved or changes that may be needed, uh, feel free to let us know. And um, I don't recall if um, Linda already reached out to all of you, but if she hasn't, she will be. There's a section on, on uh, some background for, for all the trustees. And I think one of the questions that we may be asking if we haven't already is for you to provide further information on the background that you would like to have in the introduction uh, of your background on the website. Uh, I also wanted to let you know from the personal standpoint that, that we had a, a lengthy benefit, a long tenure benefit analyst, Samantha Damaji, left city employment just last week. Uh, her duties uh, have been taken over by Tammy, who was actually an internal promotion uh, uh, in, the, in our office, and recruitment has already started uh, for this position. Samantha was a benefit analyst, and one of her specialists had to do with draws or domestic relations orders, and um, we actually also just uh, not only we moved Tammy from one side of the office to that position, but we just onboarded and in the process of onboarding a retiree really, really high uh, Terry Ferdigno, which is uh, an old tenure uh, benefit analyst at the office. Uh, so she will also be performing some of, some of those duties and, and helping uh, training staff. Uh, on the benefit analyst uh, duties, and especially in domestic relations order. 
Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the upcoming uh, quarterly newsletter is uh, going to be issued in July. And uh, one of the articles that will be included in the newsletter uh, have to do with the new and improved website. Um, and I think the, the one item that I wanted to take some time um, uh, introducing and speak to you this morning, if you bear with me, is the city uh, plan on returning uh, to on-site work. As you all know, uh, California just this week uh, sort of uh, reopened for business. Uh, the city is not quite there yet, uh, but they are going to be looking for input from departments, but generally speaking, uh, I, I will try to share some of the uh, thoughts by the city and then some of the plans that we have, and, and those plans uh, are kind of fluid uh, as we go along. Uh, we reserve the right to adjust, adjust those plans as new information becomes available. Uh, but suffice to say that the city and ORS is looking to operate uh, in the near future in a hybrid uh, mode um, with staff performing essential duties such as check printing, scanning, and mail processing, uh, probably on site, but for the most part, for the most part, at least for the near future, it's going to be business as usual, continue operating uh, remotely. Um, the city long term goal uh, for remote work. Um, is where possible to continue uh, in those areas that has been demonstrated that is efficient to use remote work. We certainly fully support that approach and uh, we will certainly try to implement that vision in our office as well. As well. But the city has uh, five guiding principles on, on this new approach of uh, returning from remote work to on-site work. And I think the overriding factor is employee health, safety, and well-being. Uh, well uh, so that's the number one issue. Uh, certainly, the effectiveness of the service delivery. But also, uh, I don't want to leave our uh, clients and members as part of that health and safety. So certainly, we want to make sure that our employees uh, are safe, but so are our members uh, and the city in general for uh, their clients. So again, uh, office time will be used when it's uh, determined that it's being used to have people at the office, uh, but that approach is going to be sort of uh, whichever word you want to use to describe her, either stagger or, or hybrid uh, or phase in. Uh, uh, and then finally, when we, which we did this kind of review already, uh, but whatever further investment in technology and process improvement that we need to implement to continue uh, allowing for the remote work uh, to be effective. Um, the self-opening by the city really is split in two initial phases. The first phase, if I'm going too fast, feel free to stop me and I'm happy to, uh, to answer questions. Uh, the initial phase is a term from July to September. Um, and the second phase will be from September to December. So um, the city already requested from departments, including uh, ORS, uh, sort of whatever soft plans we have uh, going forward, which I will share with you in a second. But suffice to say that we have decided internally that we're going to use the first phase, the initial phase from July to September, to see what works for us and what doesn't work so that we are in better position then to go to the second phase from September to December. So again, I suspect that during the first phase from July to September, it's gonna be heavily uh, led by remote work, much less by on-site work. I think as we move to the second phase, you're going to see, uh, uh, we're gonna implement lessons learned on the first phase, and you're also going to be adjustments as needed on what we learn and what works and what doesn't work. And you're going to see them slowly having some staff uh, perhaps working in back into the office. Uh, I don't really fully expect um, to have 100% uh, of the staff at the office, uh, even throughout the rest of the 2021 year. Uh, again, we have determined that there are some areas where remote work actually work and why it work. We're going to be flexible, uh, allowing uh, for that approach. So. Uh, again, it's going, if I can summarize, it wanted, it's going to be a phase in approach, and certainly there's a new normal, meaning that uh, we recognize that remote work 
actually work for us and we're going to allow that whenever possible. Um, another area that we I will keep you posted, we will have any meetings in July, the next ones are in August, but as, as we have communication, we will try as much as we have that data and information before we issue the newsletter, we will try to provide it there. If it's not, we will certainly provide it uh, through the website and then I will communicate with uh, both boards. Uh, so again, I already mentioned about the first phrase for the city uh, uh, in terms of July to September. They are looking to start staggering in some employees in July and to have a soft opening of their offices in August. We are considering something similar of having a very soft opening sometime in August or September. I suspect that when we do go that route, it will be a sort of a phase approach again, where we may just open the office for a specific hours and we will try to establish a, a, a process where members can actually make an appointment. In other words, so it won't be a full opening where the office is completely open and you can show whenever you are you would like to. Um, certainly we need to work through that those applications and see what, it, what we can implement so that members can reach out and make an appointment but we are certainly uh, are going to be pursuing that approach. As we know more about it, I will certainly, we will certainly communicate to the membership, again, whenever possible through the newsletter, if it's after July, uh, through the website, and I will keep you posted uh, in the meantime uh, until the August board meetings where I can provide my owner report. And uh, uh, lastly, obviously, uh, we wanna make sure that uh, Again, we seek out input from our own employees. So uh, senior staff is having some discussions. We're going to be issuing uh, a survey to our staff and we're planning uh, in our quarterly news, uh, quarterly meeting in July. Um, although the responses to that, those questions will be anonymous, we will share the general response. Uh, we need to be able to gather that information from our staff so that we understand you know, what are the concerns that they have? How can we be helpful when we uh, pursue opening plans and bringing people back to work? And what are the next steps? So uh, that is in general, uh, um, I recognize it's a very general uh, information because we don't have uh, a specific plans. Uh, Barbara, um, who has been working with me uh, closely on this plan, if I left anything out, and if there's anything that you wanna share, uh, Barbara Hamer, please feel free to jump in. Is there anything that you want to say on, the, on, the, on those plans or did I leave anything out? No, I think you were really comprehensive. I think you covered it. Well, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you much. And then uh, in closing, uh, Trustee um, Chair Castellano, I wanted to update you on the trustee vacancy. You know, there is a, 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 a seat that is still available. Last I heard, I don't know if any of you, like Trustee Jennings, who is probably closer to the action, have heard anything. I'm not aware that any new employee has actually come up to apply for the position. I am not aware. They may have been, but I have not been told. The goal is that, they are, that we find someone that is willing to serve as a trustee in the next few weeks. And, and the hope is that if that's the case, that the process is then implemented. And then um, if it's just one person, uh, that person then will be brought forward uh, to the city council for appointment. If it's more than one, then there is a different approach that will take a little longer. But ideally the goal will be um, if in fact the process can be um, adjusted and the city council can appoint a new trustee that you have a full board by your first meeting uh, in, in August. Um, also, I wanted to let you know the city, uh, the last meeting yesterday actually approved their budget, which is good news for us because as part of the uh, major's budget presentation, it included uh, asking approval of the budget that we presented to both boards and to the city council. So the, the budget for the Office of Retirement Services was approved. Uh, based on the overall city budget approval by city council uh, yesterday. I mentioned to all of you at the last meeting that in our uh, medical board advisor uh, RFP, we received three bids. The goal was to come before your meeting in June 
However, as we received three bits, uh, the work uh, that was needed to be done to compare and contrast and to do the due diligence and research was uh, challenging and extended, which uh, required us to then extend um, the uh, defer the recommendation to your board to your August meeting. So there's still some work to be done. There were three bits, but we will be ready to come before you at the meeting in August for the recommendation for a new board medical advisor. And uh, lastly, um, in uh, on consent, I don't know if you noticed there was a letter from Tom Yanushi announcing the closing mm -hmm. of uh, Cortex. Uh, he is moving on after some 25 years uh, actually to work for a Canadian uh, public pension plan but have agreed to continue providing some services through the end of the year, which is the reason why um, later in your agenda, there is a specific request to actually, I'm not sure what the actual word uh, uh, description is, whether it's an extension or a new contract, but we're asking for you to approve a contract with Cortex, uh, ideally an extension through December 31st, 2021, which is the timeline that he agreed to continue providing services to some of his clients as he continue, as he started works with the public pension plan. I think the overriding services that he will be provided, uh, providing in the next six months is twofold. The first one, as you all know, is the mock evaluation for the CEO and CIO performance review for uh, the calendar year that just uh, is closing on June 30th. That's a mock evaluation on the process that was recently adopted by the Joint Personnel Committee. And second, there's still some work to be done on governance policies and procedures. In fact, there is a governance committee meeting after you board meeting today. So he will then provide services on that as well. Uh, Mr. Chair, that actually concludes my comments. I, I, I apologize, but also thank you for allowing me to provide such a lengthy report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Roberta, yes. um, as to uh, the trustee position, mm -hmm. uh, there is someone within the city who is interested and will apply, but he was told that uh, per t uh, the city clerk, that it doesn't open until August. So, yeah. I, uh, thank you. I, I will follow up with our uh, uh, CD liaison. That was not my understanding. Uh, I don't want to misspeak in public, so I'm going to have to uh, go back and search what the uh, situation is and, and find out. But um, uh, rest assured that I will do my best to make sure that, uh, that the process is such that we can have someone on board by the August meeting. But let me check, and I appreciate the information. Thank you, Justin. Um, communicate with me, and I can um, uh, get you information, or we can get this to the gentleman who is interested. Very well. Okay. I, I'll, All right. I'll follow up with the city council, with our city liaison, and also with the city clerk. Thank you much. You're very welcome. Roberto, uh, could you repeat the name of the person who is um, who took over for Samantha? What was that? Was that Tammy? Yeah, I'm sorry, Tammy Imai. Tammy actually is a long tenured employee of our office. Okay. She is a staff specialist, and uh, the bulk of her work has been on the, the healthcare section. So she is moving from the healthcare area to what we call the patient side of the equation, and is uh, being promoted from staff specialist to benefit analyst. Yes, thank you. And then okay. the re rehire retiree? Uh, Terry Ferritna. Terry worked for us for many, 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 many years. Uh, recently retired, I believe, uh, 2019 or 2020. Uh, was actually in the position that was filled by Samantha and provided the uh, onboarding to Samantha before she retired. That's why we asked her to uh, see she was available and, and she was gracious enough agreed to come back to us. Okay, good, thank you. Any other questions, trustees or others? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Roberto. Item six, give me one second. Item 6B is the chair. update from the, oops, what do we have here? Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yes. Not sure what that was.
Um, it, I sounded like a member of the public, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I think it's phone number 408 0197 it looked like that was but muted now so. okay he, he, the person is connecting to audio again okay yeah there you go hello is there a member of the public wanting to speak okay roberto 6b oral update from the council am i correct um uh, Council Member Davis and uh, or a representative is not with us today, correct? That, that, that is that is correct. They're not. And as you know, uh, I didn't see it's time certain. So um, I wouldn't suggest that we kick off as much as Bill cannot wait and is so excited to make <laughs> the POB presentation. Um, I will suggest that we go to items. Oh, I think the member is on the line again. I'm sorry, you suggest that we Go to yeah, items uh, 6E and F, but but I just hear a sort of uh, in, uh, some noise in the background. I wonder if the member wants, someone wanted to ask a question. Yeah, do that. Yeah, I agree. Let's skip past um, uh, six uh, C and D for now, and we'll go through the other stuff, come back to, um, and maybe that'll take us until um, break at 10.05. But uh, let's, let's see where we go with that. Okay, 6E then is the um, discussion and action item on Cortex contract amendment that you just mentioned, extending the term of the agreement through December 31, 2021 for an additional $25,000. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, as I just indicated, uh, Cortex uh, announced uh, they're winding down their operations. Uh, Tom, uh, which I have, it has been an honor, and I question is I met him back in the mid 90s, and I have known him for almost uh, 25 years. Has provided services for Cortex uh, for that long. Uh, again, Cortex is winding down. He's joining a, a Canadian public pension plan. Uh, but uh, as you can imagine, it's hard to wind down an operation after 25 years. So he does have some work with some clients, including San Jose, which he has graciously agreed to continue through the end of the year. What this item does, and by the way, we provided uh, a copy of your current Cortex agreement uh, uh, just as a background for the services that Cortex may be providing is to extend services by Cortex through the December 31st, 2021. Uh, as, as I mentioned uh, during my earlier report, uh, the, the main two services that I foresee Cortex providing to the Fed Board is number one and foremost, the, the, um, the mock uh, evaluation, performance evaluation for the CEO and CIO um, for the 2021 fiscal year based on the current uh, performance review procedures uh, recently approved by the Joint Personnel Committee and presented to your board, as well as further uh, governance policy and, and procedures work, uh, some of which uh, will be discussed today after your board meeting at the Joint Governance Committee meeting. So. Uh, again, I'm happy to uh, answer any specific questions, but uh, I respectfully request that you board consider approving our request to extend Cortex contract to December 31st, 2021 for an additional $25,000. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any uh, questions? Um, Just a quick or, question, not about the extension of the contract per se, but are, are we uh, beginning a process of pursuing a replacement for Cortex uh, in terms of an outside consultant? That's, that, that's a good question. Uh, and you should know that your chair also asked me the same question. <laughs> um, that's an issue that I want to uh, bring before you, Bore. Uh, I am not sure um, if you ask me that there is a need to hire another consultant to provide those services from the standpoint that, um, first of all, the work by the JPC was very specific to Cortex. Uh, you, you bring a new company and they may have different ideas and that's where that was done by the JPC. So I think having the mock evaluation uh, may be sufficient. Uh, 
uh, auto challenging. In terms of uh, the rest of the governance work, uh, most of the work was completed. The reason we are extending is uh, hopefully he can finalize that kind of work. And I think um, as we move forward, all is needed is to uh, maybe adjust any kind of policies as needed uh, for flexibility purposes. Uh, that's just me. Um, but, um, so in other words, I don't know that you boards need to continue having a, an annual contract with such a consultant, but if you board feel that uh, there is a need to do that, certainly we can uh, discuss that issue at a public meeting and pursue uh, an RFP. I, I did, uh, one of the questions that I did ask Cortex was for input on, on the, since that's the industry that he works on, uh, uh, on companies that he felt um, could provide to the board similar services. So we do have have those discussions, and meaning myself and, and, uh, and Cortex, uh, and we certainly can bring that forward, but I think the first question that should be answered is, uh, by Cher is uh, whether this is a service that you board would like to continue. Uh, uh, myself, I think that you could hire someone in the future on a project basis, but again, that's just me based on experience, but if you board desire uh, an, an annual contract, we will certainly have to do that, but I, I would rather the full board makes that determination. Okay, thank you. Sounds like a future agenda item. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems that in some form, uh, because Cortex has been doing work with the JPC and the Governance Committee, um, in some form, you know, the work would be driven by the priorities of the committees, and we should have some discussion at the, perhaps at the committee level on work plan, work plan priorities, and see is do those things drive a need for the consultant, for a consultant? Um, so we'll need to have that discussion. And maybe, um, Roberto, we can talk about how to orchestrate that uh, conversation amongst those committees. Um, I think, yeah, today, I don't, I don't think we could justify uh, something beyond the 25,000. I mean, I think Vice Chair Horowitz, you're, I, I, yeah, I had the same question as you did. Um, as Roberto mentioned, but yeah, I think it should be driven by the work, but we haven't really um, had a work plan priority discussion um, from those committees. So I think we need to do that before we can figure out whether or not we need, or how much of a need there is for the consultant. Yeah, we, we certainly can have the discussion, uh, uh, Chair Castellano, we can have it offline, and next time we have uh, one on one, uh, certainly can do that, and uh, perhaps have uh, Mr. Horowitz join us, and yeah. Uh, maybe bring an item back or to the committees as you indicated, but duly noted, uh, it's a fair question and, and that's something that I will seek input from either the committees or the board, I think, before we, we can decide how to proceed. I, okay. I just add that I'd be happy to participate in that conversation. Great. Great. Thank you, Trustee Orr. All right. Um, uh, with that, if there are no other questions, uh, we need a motion and a second for item 6E discussion. Uh, with, uh, the motion would be to extend the term of the agreement with Cortex through December 21 for an additional $25,000. So I motion to oh, sorry, extend it. Okay, a motion by Trustee Jennings and a second by Trustee Orr. Any other discussion by the committee or by the board or by the public? All right. Let's do the roll call vote. Vice Chair Horowitz. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Chandra, I don't believe he's on the list. Uh, <laughs> Trustee Jennings. Aye. Thank you. Trustee Kelleher. Aye. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, Trustee Orr. Aye. And I also vote aye. That motion carries unanimously 5 to 0. Okay, thank you, um, Roberto, for that. Uh, 6F is discussion and action on changing the federated board meeting date from September 16, 2021 to September 23, 2021. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if you allow me, this is a request uh, uh, that I put forward after discussing it with uh, Chair Castellano. Um, just to give you some background, there are two months out of the year that usually, you meet in, 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 uh, on Thursdays. 
And there are two, two months out of the year where there are five Thursdays in the month. September happens to be one of them. Um, and it just so happened that usually after we come back from the July recess, both boards, uh, first meetings in closed session, entertain um, uh, separate discussions on the performance by uh, your CEO and CIO, uh, that information that is uh, put together uh, by notes from the chair and the chairs of the IC and your respective closed session meetings, then uh, are share uh, put together in a format of a performance review for the CEO and CIO after both board chairs and IC chair sit together and compare notes. Uh, then the process requires that uh, the current process that then the, the chairs of the board sit with the CEO to go over their annual performance review. The IC chairs along with myself sit down with the CIO for his annual performance review. And there are discussions on you know, potential uh, expectations or recommendations to the board on an increase, if any. Uh, then that is on a separate meeting. Uh, there's a public meeting where your board entertain discussion on first, if there's going to be an increase for the CIO and CIO, and if such, what would be the percentage increase that is going to be recommended for approval? That process in the past has taken anywhere from three to four months, meaning that it's completed either in the time frame of October to November. The city uh, review process is such that they require uh, uh, for the increases to take place in the first paycheck in October, that they are completed by the first week in October. We are never able to meet that deadline. So I, I politely ask both board chairs if they allow me bring this item to the specific boards as a request to see if by moving your September meeting from the 16th to the 23rd, uh, earlier in the month, we do the same with uh, police and fire, move their meeting from the first Thursday in September to the second Thursday. And the idea, the goal is that by moving these meetings one week, it would allow for the both board chairs to be able to get together and put together the performance review for the CEO and the IC chairs for the CIO in time to be discussed with both of us, but also in time to then bring action items back to your respective boards in September for a recommendation if in fact that is what is recommended for an increase just so that the increase can be provided to the city uh, prior to the deadline. If that information is not provided to the city by the deadline, in the past, what that has meant is that the increase to the CIO and CEO doesn't take place until February of the following year. So to avoid having to wait four months, this is the request. So again, uh, police and fire, heard the same uh, request and approved it. And again, uh, I'm, I'm respectfully requesting the board to consider this request for approval and I'm happy to answer any further questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much uh, for that, the, um, the opening discussion there. Any uh, questions by trustees? No, I support this. Sounds like a uh, creative, solution to a problem that both the CEO and CIOs do not have to um, absorb. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, I also support this. Um, uh, both the CEO and CIO have been patient in years past, waiting for four months to get the increase that we approved. So um, mm -hmm. it's, it's opportune to take advantage at least this time for uh, of the five Thursdays in September. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, uh, can I get a motion and a second to change the Federated Board meeting from September 16, 2021 to September 23, 2021? I motion to make the change. Okay, Trustee Jennings and Trustee Kelleher seconds. Thank you both. Any other discussion by the board, by the public? Okay, uh, roll call vote please, Vice Chair Horowitz. Aye. 
Thank you, Trustee Jennings. Aye. Trustee Kelleher. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Orr. Aye. Thank you, and I see Trustee Chong is still not with us. Uh, I also vote aye. That motion carries unanimously, five to zero. Thank you, everybody, for that. Um, so time check, it's um, 11, 10, 9.50. Let's go on to um, item 71A. Um, 71 is the investment committee, 71A. So the, this meeting, um, this was last on April 20, so nothing new there. 7-2 governance committee, last meeting was March 4. Um, and we have a meeting today. Um, anything, uh, Vice Chair Horowitz, before um, no, before nothing today's new meeting? report pending uh, the new meeting this afternoon. Okay, very good, thank you. 7.3 is the audit committee. Their last meeting was um, last month. Um, uh, Trustee Kelleher, on the 7A oral update from the chair, anything for you? Uh, nothing, we do have a uh, call, or I do have a call with uh, Grant Thornton uh, next week, uh, and I can update after that. Okay, very good. Uh, 73B minutes from February 18th. Um, that's receive and file. 73C is the quarterly travel and attendance for federated file. 7D is the 73D is the update from the city auditor's re recommendation to the Office of Retirement Services. That's receiving file. Yeah, Michelle, can a, you move up the, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, if Michelle or someone can move up the, uh, thank you, so I, we can see what they're referring to. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, so, Roberto, we have the 73E um, with Grant Thornton. Is that something doable? Yeah, so let me speak to those two. Okay. Um, so uh, as, as Trustee Kelleher indicated, uh, he has further uh, communication he's going to be having with Grant Thornton. Grant Thornton actually presented to the audit committee uh, for approval um, their audit plan, uh, financial audit plan for the fiscal year 2021. Uh, and um, it, it was uh, an exhaustive discussion, and the committee uh, actually uh, recommended uh, approval of the plan by Grant Thornton. And uh, I will say that uh, by doing so, they, they actually are uh, directing or asking your board to uh, take that action and approve uh, the committee recommendation to accept the audit plan by Grant Thornton. That will be um item e uh and you know we can speak to add an f after e but I, i'm happy to address any specific questions the audit plan is actually attached uh on the agenda so if there are specific questions we're happy to address any any questions uh on any on their plan but again uh, I, I think what we're looking for here is a motion by uh, the board to uh take action based on the recommendation by the audit committee okay and John is John is not with us today. Is that right? No, no, he's not. The Grant Thornton actually attended the audit committee meeting for the last two days. Meeting. Yes. Okay. I have a quick question. Um, is yeah. there anything notable within the the plan that is different from prior years? Because I, I re remember being on this committee and reviewing their schedule. So I'm just wondering if there's anything that struck uh, my colleagues uh, with respect to this specific timeline or components around risk and review. Maybe that question is for Mark. Uh, I can't speak to prior years, uh, but no, this seems I just wonder young. if there's anything that just struck you guys that's notable, or is this more of a, maybe it's a, is the objective to ensure that the broader board is aware of the specifics of the timeline? Yeah, let me, if I may, Trustee Kelleher, let me answer that question by Trustee Orr. Yeah, the, I think he's the second Trustee Orr. It's just to give the board a prize. I can tell you, if you have any specific question, obviously happy to address them, but I, I, I it, there was nothing in the plan that, that uh, struck me as a, any difference uh, uh, than prior plans. Of course, um, there's a difference from the standpoint that last year plan was right after the pandemic. Um, uh, you know, uh, started, and so I think they were still kind of uh, 
you know, wondering how that was going to work. But this is year after a full year under the pandemic, I think they are fully embracing remote work. So maybe this plan uh, does take that in consideration more than in prior years. But other than that, I, 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 there was nothing that struck me as being the, any different in terms from the risk assessment for the yeah. audit plan. No. I was just thinking about anything material different. So this is more information. No. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, very good. Um, all right. Well, with that, if there are no other questions, I'd entertain a motion in a second for 6-3-E, the uh, approval of the uh, 2021 Officer Retirement Services Retirement Plans Audit by Grantorin. So motion. Thank you, I Trustee second. Kelleher. And thank you, Trustee Jennings for the second. Any other discussion by the board, by the public? All right, let's do the roll call vote. Vice Chair Horowitz. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Jennings. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Kelleher. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Orr. Aye. Thank you, I also vote aye. That motion carries unanimously five to zero. Um, Mr. Pena, uh, six, three, seven, three F is um, Mr. Gracina's uh, presentation at 9.57. Yeah, yeah it, uh, it, so let me speak to that. Uh, Mr. Busina is actually available, but we not intended for him to present the report once again. He did that in detail at the audit committee level. This is just a receipt and file. He's okay. certainly I'm sorry. Yeah, he's certainly available. Uh, if there are any questions, either by the public or the trustees on the report and his presentation, and and before you know in the event there are any questions or comments, I do want to say. I want to uh, welcome uh, uh, our auditor, uh, Mr. Busina, to the meeting. Uh, I have to say um, he has extensive experience in the public arena. Um, as challenging as that may be because he does a lot of work, which actually means more work <laughs> for everyone else at the office. I'm so excited to have him on board. Um, this is exactly what we envision when we actually um, recommended this position, which is uh, really twofold. Uh, I don't know if many of you know that my background actually, my educational uh, background is accounting. I was a CPA and a CIA myself. Uh, so I do enjoy this. Um, I did this for the first 10 years of my professional experience. Um, so we envision these kind of reviews, very detailed, and, and the concept here is, number one, uh, from a compliance standpoint, we want to make sure that we're compliant, right, with uh, rules and regulations and requirements. But second, to the extent that we, uh, any recommendation can make us more efficient and effective, we actually embrace that approach as well. So. I, I'm just sort of uh, stay, setting the stage to let you know you're going to be receiving a lot more of these kind of reviews that are very detailed, uh, very well thought out, and, uh, and very good findings. Uh, I'm all for it. Uh, it's needed. Uh, it is a lot of work, not only from the auditing standpoint, but for the rest of the staff. This is the only way we can get better and be more efficient. So. I do want to thank publicly uh, our auditor. And again, uh, he is available in the event. Uh, you bore all the public have any specific questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto. Welcome, Mr. Christina. Um, any uh, questions by the committee? I, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't see the receiving file, so that was my mistake. Uh, um, Mr. Pena, I'm glad now you have someone with whom you can have audit conversation. <laughs> I, I, I try, but you know, I did audits back in the 1990s. It's been almost 30 years. So sometimes it comes out with information or, or, or yes. issues uh, that I don't even know what he's talking about, although I make it look like I know, but oh man, I don't know everything. Sometimes I don't know what you're referring to. Anyway, so thank you. Yeah, if you can receive and file the item, but uh, once again, I yes. think this, this is one of many. Uh, I do encourage you in the future, please, he will make the specific recommendations or presentations to the audit committee, but I encourage you to the extent possible, 
I know they are lengthy, uh, but if you have the chance to review them in detail and you have questions at the board level, feel free to ask. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Okay, so 7-3-F is receiving file. 7-4 is a joint personnel committee. Last meeting was April 30th. Um, Trustee Orr, did you have anything you wanted to note? Sorry, there's nothing there. No, 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 no specific update. Oh, yeah, well thank covered. you. Okay, uh, section eight of the agenda, education and training, we have the Cortex report and uh, SACRS is next month. So um, let's see, let me ask if there are any future agenda items. Next month, we are not having a meeting. We're not, but as future items, I think as as uh, Vice Chair Horowitz indicated, uh, and we can discuss this in our one-on-one, -on -one, uh, Chair Castellano, and at the end of the review, but we, we wanna consider you mentioned committees, we'll talk about that, but whether you should go to a committee or a future board meeting, the discussion on whether or not to entertain services uh, post cortex, uh, that's something that should be considered for the future, that's all. Yeah, okay, very good. Um, are there um, any public or retired comments? Mr. Chair? Yes. Hello, Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, this is Brady Mamura. Um, I'm a I beneficiary. Bet. Yes. I just want to make my comments real brief. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Pena, I've been waiting for your phone call since last month. So uh, just wanted to remind you, this is just another example of uh, the kind of uh, service we're getting out of the retirement office. You had promised to call me at the last meeting. Anyway, You're I'm just going to leave it at that. But but uh, anyway, I wanted to, to continue and, and just make my comments real quick. I know you had a long meeting. I am concerned about the vacancy, um, the uh, active uh, employee uh, vacancy, uh, the trustee position. Uh, that position has been apparently very difficult to fill over the past few years, as you know. Uh, obviously, there is a, a problem with that. Um, now you're basically going to be operating with uh, six board members because, as you know, the learning curve is extremely steep. So this new person that you're going to get is probably going to be, you know, uh, again, on the learning curve for probably a year or more. And uh, hopefully those uh, the public members who are trustees will uh, hopefully stick around because there's been a lot of turnover in that as well. Uh, again, I expressed my concern to the city council about the management of the, of the retirement uh, funds and, and the federated funds specifically. Uh, I know, uh, and again, this is nothing negative, but it's just, to me, it's just to be honest that uh, many boards, and this one is no difference, you sometimes exploit the ignorance of the uh, people that you're supposed to be representing. And I just want to remind the uh, trustees, your fiduciaries, you're not only accountable to the taxpayers, you're obviously accountable to the beneficiaries and the uh, active employees are going to be, uh, you know, dependent on the retirement funds being there when they retire. So anyway, uh, I wish you all good luck. Uh, still waiting for your call, Mr. Pena, and uh, you all have a good uh, summer vacation. Or a month off. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Imamura. Okay, um, so it's um, 10 04. Uh, I'm, I, I'd like to go ahead and uh, have us take a break, and then we will come back at 10 15 for uh, Ms. Shembri's uh, item 6 uh, C regarding the um, stop of pension contributions for employees over 30, and then the then right after that will be um, the uh, pension obligation bond presentation by Chiron. So we'll, we'll come back for those two items at 1015. Thank you, everybody.
I have 10.15 on my clock, so we're gonna go ahead and resume back on the agenda. Again, we have two items remaining. That is uh, item 6C that we're about to uh, take that are time certain at 10.15, as well as 6D, the pension obligation bond. So uh, on 6C, uh, Ms. Jennifer Shembri is here, and this is the ordinance amending the municipal code to stop pension contribution for employees with over 30 years of city service. Welcome, Ms. Shembri. Thank you. Um, Jennifer Shembri, Director of Employee Relations and Human Resources. Um, so what we are looking to do here, as the memo indicates, is to be able to stop pension contributions um, for employees who have over 30 years of service. Uh, so something that our understanding is, is that other agencies do, and it's um, a way we could retain some of our uh, longer-term employees, um, keep them here uh, for... Um, you know, education reasons and, and all that sort of stuff, um, building the bench, helping us train. Um, so I think that that is, uh, it's only affects 28 employees right now. Um, and that's kind of citywide. We don't yet have an agreement with all the bargaining units to do this. So um, what we've drafted the municipal code in a way that we would um, add as we get agreements with some of the bargaining units, but we would definitely take it right now for our unrepresented and the few bargaining units that have since um, agreed to it. But um, hopefully not a big issue given the small number of employees that it affects. We have talked to Bill Hallmark about this a couple of different times, um, and he's given us some advice on it and um, kind of how to craft it. And so I'm happy to answer any questions on this. Um, and then we're also asking, I think, to be able to talk to um, Harvey to get kind of direct feedback, uh, give him the authority to kind of give us direct feedback on any sort of ordinance before we take it to council, which I think is on the 29th council agenda. Okay, thank you very much. Are there questions by trustees? Uh, could you clarify, please, Jennifer, the 28 that you mentioned, is that just for uh, the unit 99 or is that a citywide number? That's a citywide number. Okay. And for the for unit 99 and then the other two groups that with the oral agreement of that 28, what are we talking about? I, mean, I actually do not know the breakdown of that. Um, okay. Yeah, I would assume, I don't think we have that in the memo and I do not have that in front of me. Okay. No problem. And so, and I'm sorry, could you also say again, uh, I missed it in the words, um, the actual, the actuarial work behind the change, do we, is it already done? You would say you've spoken with Bill, is the work already done? Do we know how the, how the, I, I, I obviously the numbers are yes, minimal so in terms of employees, but what, what, what the dollar impact is? Um, so my understanding is there's no dollar impact from um, Bill Hallmark. Can we put that in um, our memo? Actually, it's in our council memo. What he indicated was that that uh, there would be no actuarial impact because it was important that we didn't have any sort of um, charter issue where we would have to take, it would be uh, seen as a uh, impact because the costs would go up. Um, and he said that that was not the case, how we were structuring it. Um, the if I can jump in here, Mr. Chair, uh, Jennifer is correct, and uh, and I, I did see that communication. Um, I, I'll defer to obviously uh, Bill on the comments. Uh, I seem to remember that obviously I think he he qualified that statement by saying that there was no change on behavior by the membership. Um, uh, but Jennifer is correct. Uh, generally speaking, if there's no change. In behavior by the membership, there shouldn't be any any cost impact, and uh, and it is to a minuscule number of members, as she indicated. She didn't use the word minuscule, but twenty eight out of many thousands is not that many. Yeah. Um, uh, we have had discussions with council and and Jenny Kranger, Jennifer. You don't know Jenny. Jenny uh, uh, is with Chris Smith. She works with uh, closely with Harvey. Uh, we have had discussions with them, and we stand ready to uh, provide your input. Uh, but I do wanted to uh, reach out to Bill because of my conversations with Bill. Um, I, I think that there was some expectations on the language, and I think he wanted 
Bill, I don't want to speak for you because I probably will not explain it correctly, but you wanted to make sure that you understood what was meant by a specific language on the ordinance so that so that uh, you can understand and have a better, this, better idea as to whether you could potentially be any impact or not. Again, I'll just turn it over to Bill because he has more specific questions from an actual standpoint. Bill? Yeah, let me just clarify quickly. There's uh, no change to the total cost of the system as long as there's no behavior change because we're, we're not changing the benefits. Right. What it is changing is um, certain members are no longer going to make contributions. Right. And so there's a uh, potential shift in costs here to make up for those contributions. And my understanding from initial conversations with the city was that the city intended ultimately to, to cover those contributions. Uh, in our conversations with Reed Smith, they caused us to go back and look at the language in the current municipal code. And so I raised a concern that that language might imply that we need to spread those costs over the remaining members who have less than 30 years of service. So it, I think we just wanted to clarify that the city's intent is, is that they would cover those costs or it would be a shift to the city. And then uh, in the process of reviewing the amendment, we can review the language to make sure that it would accomplish that. Yes, that was what we had thought would happen was that it would get shifted to the city. And, and we are, you know, it's 28 people. So <laughs> in the context of the whole plan, we're talking about pretty small dollar amounts here. Yes, I agree. So just to make sure that I understood and, and to summarize everything, it, it is, that was the intention by the city as Jennifer indicated, that's what the language seems to suggest, and we will make sure working with Rismi and Chiron that the ordinance language actually um, meets the intended result, which is shifting the cost to the city. And if that's the case, I think that, uh, you know, that's, that's all that is needed. And I guess the city uh, then will go to the city council on the 29th that's seeking approval. But did I, Summarize it correctly, Jennifer and, uh, and Bill? Yes, correct. Yes, I think so. Okay, all right. So this is for question, Jenny. Yeah, no. I have a question too. Go ahead, Jenny. Go ahead, Elaine. You want to go first? Uh, just a couple things that sort of struck me. So you've got another 110 employees that will potentially be eligible. But regardless, I want to just ask Jennifer, the, the if you have any color, that is, in the conversations with the union uh, representatives, because I'd just like to get a sense of how either the current 28 employees who are eligible or how other uh, employees in the system uh, generally react to this potential change. So for the people who would be impacted, the employees over 30 years, see it as very beneficial um, and uh -huh. that it would um, cause them to stay, potentially stay longer with the city rather than leaving. I think people say, well, once I max out on my retirement and if I still have to keep paying for it, I'm just going to leave. Um, and so it's kind of an incentive to get those people uh, to stay. And that's the driving force, you would say? That's the driving motivation overall? Yes, correct. All of this, thank you. Just wanted to clarify. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also something that is in other agencies. So other plans have this. Um, so it kind of makes sense to do the same over here. Uh, this is Trustee Jennings. Um, so if an employee reaches their 30 years, right, they max out at that point. So the cost of the percentage, the 75%, assuming they're um, not police, um, that's the maximum they get. So there's, in that way, there's no additional cost to the, the pension. However, I guess if they stay, let's say they stay 35 years, their salary could still be increasing. And so that would be the additional cost to the pension because it's tier one is based on the highest one year um, salary. So is that the piece that the city will be picking up because they won't be paying into it anymore? 
Uh, let me take that. Um, okay. The the piece the city would be paying is what the members' contributions would have been for those additional five years. The actual costs to the system are fairly complex because uh, you do have the increase in the benefit amounts for salary increases during that additional five years, but you also have not paid any benefits during those five years and no COLAs during those five years. And so that's the same. So you've got offsetting costs. So in, in many cases, mm -hmm. them uh, delaying uh, adds really no cost or actually might even make it cheaper. Minimum. When you take those two offsetting pieces. It depends on their specific circumstances and what age they were when they hit the 30 years and all of that in terms so of- So why does the city have to money. pick it up then? If there's no additional cost and if they're only gonna get to 75%, um, why is there any obligation to pay? I'm a little confused with that. Well, because we have uh, allocated the the costs. The costs aren't changing, but we've allocated the costs between members uh, and the city, and all of a sudden, a portion of that the piece that was going to be paid by members is no longer being paid. So someone just has to pick up that uh, little piece uh, in the in the costs. And if other than yeah, go ahead. Um, thanks. If I could just add one um, one one thought that might help. Um, you know, certainly from the city's perspective, we would think of, the city would think about it in terms of cost. And, and so the question that Jennifer presented and that the city is asking is, you know, what's this going to do to the city's cost? But it's really not from the board's perspective, a cost to the system. It's nor is it a decision that the board um, makes. It's, it's a, it's about, it, you know, these, funds don't come from the 30 plus year member, they're going to get built into the rate um, and come from another source. And so from, so it's, so I, I don't want the board to think that there's a cost to the system. It's just about, um, it could be a cost to the city, but from the, the, the system standpoint, it's just about now where there's potentially a, a little deficit from what we would have received from those members, it's going to get built in somewhere else. Okay, but I'm belaboring this point. Um, should we have ever been getting that amount? I mean, if they've maxed out, why should why should that be? And should we be not counting them? It just uh, Bill would love to answer that question, right, Bill? So it's just the. The structure of the system divides the cost between the members and the city. And, and um, how you pay for the, the benefits that are promised is just a policy decision and it's driven by the municipal code. And so that's how the costs were, have been allocated. Um, and, and this would just cause a slight shift in how those costs are allocated. And, and I would just add that um, it's very common to do it both ways. You know, as Jennifer said, there's a lot of plans that have a feature like the one the city's considering and the Searle systems have it. And there's a lot of plans that don't. Um, so there's not really a right or wrong way to do it. And then, and then my last comment in response um, to your question, Trustee Jennings, is that that's also really a, a plan sponsor decision of how that the plan gets funded. Um, and so, so A, I would say there's not necessarily a right or wrong way to do it, and B, that's a decision that really belongs with the city. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I, I, I believe I understand the expense and the revenue side and the, and the, the plan itself, there, were, there will, will continue to be intact. My question is more, it's really administrative, so to the extent that the city's going to pick up that extra small, very small little piece. But to the extent the city's going to pick that up, that need, does that need to be codified someplace in a document that the board needs to see, or is that all handled on the city side with the, in, in the code? 
So Jennifer, let me get a shot of this and then you can correct me. I think the way the city is clarifying this is through the ordinance. And so that's what's going to be, is that correct? You issued the ordinance, which is approved by the city council. But I think to even further to answer your question, Chair Castellano, we do, once that's completed, we do have to do some upgrades in our system to account for that change. So every bi-weekly, there are contributions that the system is expecting from payroll. And so yeah. now we need to, we need to um, upgrade or adjust the system to understand if so-and-so has 30 more years, don't expect contribution from the member. Otherwise, we're going to get a lot of uh, errors uh, on the on the uh, migration from the payroll to to our system. So there are some things that once that's accomplished, we need to change at the at our uh, administrative system. Uh, Barbara can speak more eloquently and detail on that. But from the city standpoint, the way they do is is issuing the ordinance, and and that's and, and again, I think what Jenny um, Jenny, I apologize. Thank you, Jenny. Jennifer. <laughs> was uh, commenting is that, hey, if there are any specific language changes that are needed to make sure that we are approving what's intended, let us know. And I think if I understood it correctly, the way it is written right now is fine. Uh, and that's the intention. And, uh, and you know, uh, I don't foresee any more changes. But if anything's come up, Jennifer, we'll make sure that we'll send you any further information. Thank you. Okay. So the, yeah, I just wanted to understand and know what to expect. So there's nothing on the policy. We don't need to update any policies. Um, but there is the administrative implementation, the payroll component. Okay, great. Any other questions from trustees? Thank you, Jennifer, for taking the time to um, talk to us about this uh, matter. All right, shall we go on? Thank, Thank you, Jennifer. Yes. yes, yeah, the next Thank item you. is the yeah. Okay, all right, so we'll go on to six, D, it's the pension obligation bonds educational presentation by Chiron. Remember, yeah, you want to kick that off? Yeah, let me, if, I, if you allow me, about three to five minutes before Bill starts his educational presentation, which he cannot wait. If you're looking at him, he could be smiling. He cannot wait to present to you. Um, just wanted to give you some background on, on how we arrived to this particular educational presentation. Back in 2019, the Retirement Stakeholder Solutions Working Group uh, was actually put together by the mayor. Um, and and the, the concept was uh, to put some um, members together uh, to come up with ideas uh, to help improve the health of the pension plans. Uh, and, and just for sake of, uh, of uh, transparency, that the Retirement Solutions Working Group was comprised of city council members, members of the public, city staff, actually federated board members, police and fire board members. Um, and, uh, and in fact, uh, Prabhu as CIO and, uh, and myself as CEO of the retirement office. Um, of course, because of the pandemic, uh, we did not meet for, for a few months, but we came back in 2021 and um, the working group uh, recommended uh, various options. And uh, they finally issue uh, in the spring of 2021, about April, they issued their final report, uh, exploring uh, different ways to reduce the, the total city on funded liability for the pension plans. And, and the, the number one issue that came up uh, as, a, as a possible solution to decreasing the pension liability was uh, the issuance of pension obligation bonds. Uh, that, that's really what has brought us here uh, this morning. And, and um, I should also mention, obviously I have been meeting with the city staff on these issues, uh, city meets with city council and I meet with uh, both of the boards. And um, uh, I just want to also mention that uh, increased leverage was actually identified as one of the risks associated with issuing uh, POVs. Um, earlier in April, the city council uh, actually received a presentation on POV, which um, I forward to all the board members, um, just to let you know that presentation was taking place in case you had a chance to join the presentation. 
uh, even though it was geared towards city council education, I thought it was a good piece of education for board members as well. And so they actually um, obviously was presented by city staff and, and city consultants. So it was really uh, viewed from a standpoint of, uh, of the uh, city responsibilities and everything else. And so again, it was a four hour discussion. Uh, but again, the whole concept of this POB is that the city um, is wanting to make sure that the retirement plans health uh, improve and that they are sustainable for the long haul. Uh, and therefore, that's the reason why they want to decrease the funding liability, thereby obviously increasing the, the funding ratio. Um, I just want to make it clear, the city has not decided yet uh, whether or not to issue a POB. In fact, um, the city staff was going to go to the city council on June 29, but decided to delay the presentation back to August. Uh, and the presentation is going to be such so that the city council can decide if they do want to move ahead with the validation for the issuance of uh, POBs. Uh, because one that approval by city council uh, is completed, city will have uh, 60 days uh, to go to the courts to validate uh, the issuance of the pension obligation bonds. So since the city is actually recess in July, they didn't want to sort of waste 30 days out of those 60 days that they have to go to court. Um, the city is aware that um, understand that the plans have to make decisions in terms of uh, if they do end up issuing, again, I want to emphasize they haven't decided whether they want to issue POVs, and even if they do, there have been no discussions as to the amount of the issuance they are considering, or even how much of that, if they do issue POVs, will be split between federated and the police and fire plans. Um, the city also, the city staff reminds me uh, often uh, that they feel that the plans should be agnostic as to the sources of the funding that comes from the city standpoint to fund the, uh, the pension plans. And I believe we are agnostic. Uh, all we, and I don't want to speak for the board members, but all that we want to ensure is that the plans contributions, uh, required contributions are made on an annual basis and that the funding you know, and then the plan state that information, uh, that input, uh, those contributions along with the employees and, and, and obviously make decisions from the investment standpoint. Um, there's also uh, city staff has been working with city council. Again, they will be going to the city, probably council in Agos uh, to determine whether or not to move forward. We have tentatively city staff um, uh, on us spoken about saving the date of September 30th as a possible day for the joint meeting of the city council and both boards. I think um, your fiduciary council has been very clear and I think Jenny will speak to it today very clear as to what your fiduciary duties are in terms of this process. Uh, obviously, uh, you overriding responsibilities to the members of the plan. Um, but that's not to say that you don't want to be ready when you have a joint meeting with the city council to be able to answer questions that they may have so that they fully informed to make a decision on whether or not to move forward with the POB. Uh, so again, and I, I should mention as part of the presentation by the city consultants to the city council, they, they spoke about uh, many issues that uh, Bill is going to be covering today uh, in terms of investment crediting and also amortization policies for the POB uh, proceeds. Uh, so I think I don't want to speak for Bill. He does that from an actuary standpoint uh, point much better than I do. And, and Jenny does it much better than I do from the legal standpoint. I leave that to those experts. But suffice to say that this is an educational presentation. We want to make sure that you ask questions. Uh, we have consultants in here to address those issues so that you are educated on what are your responsibilities to the plans. And at the end of the day, um, I want to make sure that you are fully educated uh, and have answered to questions so that when 
if in fact the city decides to move forward with the POV and there is a joint meeting, um, we can have a meaningful discussion and answering questions from both sides. So you may have questions for the city, the city may have questions for the board, so that everyone is clear if in fact the city move forward with the issues of POVs, uh, what the expectations are and where the responsibilities lie. So with that, I uh, just wanted to set it up uh, for the discussion. Uh, I'll turn it over to, to Bill for his presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Roberto. Let me bring my screen up here. So hopefully you're seeing my screen now. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, this is primarily an educational presentation and we want, I know um, some of you were involved with the uh, Retirement Stakeholder Solutions Work Group and have seen some of this information, uh, but we wanted to make sure that uh, we got the board uh, some background and understanding of pension obligation bonds. And then uh, specifically talking about some of the um, actuarial decisions related to uh, receiving a pension obligation. So um, we're gonna do just some, some background history, uh, looking at the analysis of pension obligation bonds in the city's perspective, and then finish up focusing on what the retirement board's role and options are uh, in dealing with the pension obligation bond. I should say, uh, please interrupt as we go along if you have questions so that we can address them at that time. Uh, I'll try and make sure that I can um, recognize you and let you in. Um, but I'd like to get that dialogue going uh, as we go through this. So back in 1985, the city of Oakland issued the first pension obligation bond and they realized they could issue a tax exempt bond uh, and invest it in higher yielding taxable securities and essentially create an arbitrage between taxable and tax exempt yields. Uh, and, and so that was very, um, a very keen observation and, and um, strategy. It didn't take Congress long to figure out what was going on. And so with the Tax Reform Act of 1986, they eliminated the tax exemption for pension obligation bonds. So that takes uh, away that uh, sort of arbitrage opportunity. Uh, you could still technically uh, pull off the same thing and the city's municipal advisor referred to this as the tax exempt exchange where the city would issue a tax exempt bond for some other purpose uh, that they were planning to pay for out of uh, the city's budget and then put those funds into um, the pension plan. And so you could theoretically still get a tax exempt exchange, but those opportunities are much more limited. And um, my understanding is the city doesn't see an opportunity for that right now. So since that uh, change to the tax law, the argument for a pension obligation bond has really um, most often been based on what's called actuarial arbitrage. And that is that the difference between the borrowing rate and the assumed rate of return uh, is treated like refinancing a mortgage. Uh, so if we are assuming six and five eighths and they can borrow at three, that difference uh, creates a, a savings. Now the word arbitrage implies that there's a guaranteed gain, but there is no guarantee with our assumption. Our assumption is just an assumption. And so the actual returns uh, are whatever they are. Uh, and so there, there is no guarantee or arbitrage involved in that exchange. 
there have been uh, a lot of POBs issued. Uh, the Center for Retirement Research tallied them up from 85 to 2013 uh, as 105 billion. Um, I saw a presentation from Standard and Poor's where they said they saw a significant increase, including 16 billion in 2020, 14 billion of which was from California uh, cities and government admins. The success or failure of these has largely depended on the timing of issuance. Um, so if they're issued just before the market takes off, they are a wonderful success. Uh, one of the most high profile um, failures was New Jersey, who issued a very large pension obligation bond just before the dot-com bust. And that had um, significant consequences for them. Here are the charts of the issuances um, that were tallied by the Center for Retirement Research. And you can see 2003 was a, a big year for issuances. Uh, and that timing, I think, turned out to actually be pretty good. If you look, uh, they have it by state and separated between pre-2009 and post-2009. So most of them were issued uh, pre-2009. Illinois had uh, quite a bit of activity since 2009. Um, but this is only um, through 2013. So it's not picking up the recent uptick in the issuances of pension obligation bonds. Now, how do these work? Uh, well, from the city's perspective, if we take a hypothetical $1 billion POB, and I want to emphasize, I just picked a hypothetical 1 billion. This is not saying the city's going to issue a $1 billion POB. We do not know the amounts. Um, but you can look at the city's balance sheet, and they've got uh, UALs, or they call them uh, net pension liability or net OPEB liability on their balance sheets. And then they also have uh, all of their other debt. Uh, and so all of that stacks up to be the liability for the city on the, their balance sheet. When they issue a POB, what they essentially do is they replace a portion of the pension UAL with the POB. And the total debt on the city's balance sheet does not change at all. It just shifts a little bit. And, and so this is often described as exchanging a soft liability for a hard liability. And, and I want to talk about what that means and what um, the implications of that are. The, the pension and OPEB UALs are referred to soft li as soft liabilities for two reasons. One, um, the amount changes year to year depending on the experiences of the plan. And the payments on those are, um, are somewhat flexible. In our case, the retirement boards decide what the payments are to the plans, and then the city makes that payment. But we can change those payment patterns at any time we want. The hard liability, the city debt, and a POB, the amount that is owed is fixed and the payments are usually fixed as well. So you, uh, you can't change that. Now, from our perspective, the pension UAL ha has dropped uh, and we're receiving more assets in. The one thing we need to keep in mind here, however, is that we rely on the city's capacity to fund the UAL in the future. And in particular, if investment returns don't turn out as expected. And increasing the hard debt the city has to pay creates a competing, uh, creates competition for those city resources to pay for our unfunded liability. So um, there is some 
marginal change uh, in the future competition for those resources because we now fixed in a, a hard debt um, to replace part of the pension rail. Now, from the city's perspective, and, and I want to be clear, this is not the plan's perspective, uh, issuing a POB adds leverage to the city and their obligations. So uh, if you look at the current plan, we've got the pension assets. And when we add the POB, we still have those pension assets, but then we have the borrowed assets of the POB. And then the city owns this debt. And so the idea is to borrow this money at a low interest rate and then invest it with the pension assets and it pays off if the investment return is greater than you paid on the interest on the debt. From the city's perspective, that is, creates a very similar dynamic to if the pension, if the retirement board had decided to add leverage to its portfolio. So we're seeing some retirement systems across the country actually add leverage to their uh, retirement portfolio and borrow money and invest it. Same as underlying dynamic of low interest rates creating an opportunity potentially to borrow cheaply and then invest the proceeds and, and hope for a, a higher return. Now there are some key differences between the two, even though that underlying dynamic is the same. For the POB, that's a city decision, not a retirement board decision. So it's not something that, that you as trustees are making a decision on. It's the city it is making that decision and the city owes that debt. The pension assets are not at risk at all. Whereas if, if you had added leverage to the portfolio, you could have a, a call to pay that debt and all of that would come out of the pension assets. Here, if, if for some reason uh, the city goes into a bankruptcy and defaults on the POB, and, and we've seen this in some of the municipal bankruptcies, the pension plan gets to keep those borrowed assets and it's the bondholders who, who take the, the haircut. Um, so, so there is, um, there are some key differences between these two approaches, but outside of a bankruptcy situation, if you look from the city's perspective, it, it's the same underlying economic dynamic. Now, the other piece that comes into this is that POBs can change the pattern of contributions. And, and often this becomes a key part of the decision to issue a POB. And, and um, so what's happening is before the POB, uh, we have the pension UAL and we talk about the interest on that at our expected rate of return. And we can set up different amortization methods and all of that, but just to illustrate, let's assume we were just charging the interest only on the UAL. We look at something like this for the billion dollar bond. After the POB, you have a, a smaller uh, UAL, so that interest to the pension plan is smaller. And then the POB in this example is issued at 3% instead of our 6.625 expected return. So the interest on that POB is lower. Now, it, these are kind of different concepts though, because the interest on the pension UAL is just our assumed rate of return. It's not a fixed number, whereas the POB is actually uh, an interest charge. The retirement board really sets this pattern and can change the, the 
contribution schedule for the UAL at any time. We, we revisit it every year. We have a policy that's based on 20 year amortizations, but, um, but we can, can make changes to that. Uh, and we have recently on the police and fire side, we have not um, for some time on the federated side, we've stuck pretty much with it. But this dynamic uh, appears and has um, created an appearance of an incentive that the board could be uh, providing to issue a POV because if you just let the policy work without specifically addressing a POV, you will reduce the city's contribution to the pension plan by more than they have to pay on the POV. And so you create a short-term contribution incentive that makes it look like they're getting an arbitrage or like they're refinancing a mortgage when they're not really doing that. They're borrowing at a low interest rate to invest and try and achieve a higher return. Any questions on that part before I move into some of the analysis? It's Trustee Jennings. So on the PAR screen, um, if the amount is less than what they would the sponsor would normally provide us does that would be to their benefit to take that amount and put it aside to pay for the pob i mean it's on the sponsor's side not ours but is that correct well um we'll get into some illustrations here that show the how the dynamic plays out over time mm -hmm. but but initially what happens is um we we reduce the contribution if we just follow our standard procedures we would reduce the contribution to the pension plan for having mm -hmm. received the pob assets mm -hmm. but we reduce it by more than they pay for the pob so there's a net reduction in the city's contribution Mm -hmm. which means whenever they can borrow at less than what we expect to return, they're being provided a short-term incentive um, in the form of reduced contributions to, to make that exchange. So it's a savings to them on an annual basis, but then they can use that money for other purposes. Right, but it's, um, it's only because we credit them or the expected return for the whole period of the loan. Mm -hmm. And then if they if we don't actually earn that expected return, we charge it to them later. Mm -hmm. So if, or we, if we lower our discount rate. Or right, we change things up if we do some of those things. So um, okay. I'll let you go on. It, it, it's really a short-term incentive that we're providing. Uh, right over the long term, they're going to have to pay what needs to be paid. So R Roberto referred to some of the work the city's done, and um, I took some of the stuff from the April City Council presentation and just distilled it uh, here. Um, to look at how the city is viewing the challenge here. Uh, and one of the key things they point out correctly is that the, the costs for the retirement systems have been an increasing portion of the general fund budget and is significantly increasing, uh, going from six and a half percent in uh, 2001 to almost 21% in 2021. Uh, and, and I think we've been aware of that. We've talked about that the last few years about um, that, that level of increase that was needed largely after the 2009 crash uh, to restore the funding of the systems. 
They know that only Chicago has higher fixed costs as a percentage of government expenditures, where fixed costs are debt service plus pension contributions and OPEB contributions. And so this 21% they're noting constrains their ability to fund other city priorities. So if we're taking 21% of the general fund budget, then they can't spend it on other things. Uh, we were looking at a $3.7 billion UAL as of June 30th, 2020. And um, they use these projections that we prepared from the June 30th, 2020 valuation. Uh, we showed you the, the green bars here are the federated and then the blue are the police and fire uh, pension and OPEB. And I think we originally put this slide together for Roberto to brief the city council. Um, but they note this total contribution and the projection for it to increase from 471 million in this coming fiscal year to 549 million by 2029 before it starts to go down. And so that's part of the, the burden that they are concerned about. So the potential benefits they're seeing are they could reduce the contributions for the pension and OPEB and prevent the contributions from rising through 2029 and potentially prevent the erosion of funding for other city services and programs. They could use those savings to either accelerate the payment on the UAL or to ease those current budget pressures. And so that's really been the focus uh, of what they see on the POB. So we wanted to respond to a couple things and clarify. Um, first, the comparison to Chicago um, it is correct based on what we're charging and what Chicago's actually paying. But we've set the contributions at that high level by choice. Uh, Chicago is not paying anything comparable compared to their UAL. We are paying down the UAL relatively rapidly. Um, and, and so if those contribution levels are too high, um, it, it suggests we have a conversation because we have um, really intentionally raised those contribution levels up to try and get the funds, the systems paid off quicker. Uh, and the police and fire board is really pay, really ramped theirs up. So they are um, looking at a fairly short uh, period to get to 100% funded compared to federated. Um, but there, there is some flexibility there. And I know the boards have looked at trying to balance the burdens on the city versus the needs of the plan and trying to strike that balance. Um, and so that's one thing is with a single employer plan, we can work directly with the city and figure out the appropriate uh, balance there. We have to make sure that the pension plan is okay and we're comfortable with the risks that the pension plan has and that we're securing the, the benefits. But there isn't just a single answer on what our contribution policy should be. There, um, there are things for us um, that we could look at. Bill, you mentioned that we have Police and fire is different from federated in terms of the estimated payoff, and I believe ours is early 2040s. How, how quick is the police and fire estimated payoff? They're, um, they get, well, they've been using 15 year amortizations for a long time, uh, where we've been using 20 year. And the large pieces of that, those 15 year amortizations have been paid down and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but uh, you know, I think they have um, 
a lot fewer years left on them. So if you look at 2009 uh, plus 15 years, uh, plus their five-year asset smoothing, those big bases uh, yeah. will be paid off in the next uh, five to 10 years. Okay, thank you. Okay, but um, we use five-year smoothing too, right? Right, we use five-year smoothing, but we use a 20-year amortization and the 2009 um, debt we did at 25 years. Wow. So really? that put us like 10 years behind them in terms of that schedule. That was at 25 years. Yes. Prior to 2009, um, hmm. the federated system used a 30 year rolling amortization. Uh -huh. So every year they re amortized at 30 years. And so the transition to scale up the funding was much more difficult on federated mm -hmm. where police and fire already had um, the 15 year amortization in place. So they used 15 years for the 2009 law? Yeah, oh, actually they had, I'm sorry, they had been using two, 16 years uh, and then changed it to 15, so. Okay, but they were 16. 15 years for the 2009 loss and, yes. and federated was um, 25. 25 years. So that's maybe part of the funding um, issues it, between. It is, although yeah. the funding issues were there before the 2009 loss too. Hmm. Thank you. So um, I just want to note, when I say the pension obligation bonds add leverage to the city's contributions, when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about the city's contributions in total, both to the pension plan and to pay off the pension obligation bond. So if you lump those, treat those as one bucket, um, because the city's contributions to the pension plan will go down, but then they have the, the contributions for um, the pension obligation bond to pay off the pension obligation bond. And so that's what creates the, the leverage is those pension obligation bond payments are fixed and, and don't change. And if we get good asset returns, the city comes out um, spectacularly. If we get poor asset returns, it um, adds to the pain. Now, the other thing I wanted to note um, is <laughs> we've had really good investment performance this year. And so the whole outlook has changed from what was presented at the April City Council meeting based on our 2020 valuation. Um, so I put this together with an assumption of a 20% return. I think Prabhu said today, uh, the federated systems up to 27%. Uh, I suspect police and fire is slightly lower because they were have a slightly more conservative allocation. But just to give an illustration with the 20% return, combining the plans, we expect to have gone from being 61% funded to 71% funded. And for that $3.7 billion UAL to now only be 2.9 billion with 20%. And that would be even better with, if we hold on these last uh, um, two weeks here uh, to the investment returns. You get a similar effect on the OPEB pieces. Uh, it's much smaller and not as well funded, so it's it's not quite as uh, dynamic, uh, but it, it also reduces those liabilities. So that chart that we showed before has really changed. Uh, if we do the 20% return, the red line here represents the totals that I showed on the, the prior slide. And if we update those for 20% returns, 
uh, we phase the we recognize those over five years. But assuming all our other assumptions are met and we get 6.625% uh, going forward, um, we'd be looking just next year at a reduction of about 16 million in contributions. Um, but out here at 2029, you're looking at 95 million reduction in city contributions. And you're not seeing the, the increase that they were very concerned about. The contributions are actually level to declining. So um, the investment returns have, have really um, changed the picture going forward, uh, if we can hang on uh, to those returns. Just looking at the federated piece, uh, this was with a 20% return uh, the funding on a market value basis would go from 50% to 58% funded. So we still have a ways to go. Uh, it'd be a little better with the 27% return. Uh, but you can see the projection of contributions, uh, while still significant, uh, doesn't increase as much as, as we go out. Uh, reflecting those larger returns in larger asset piece. Um, Bill, Trustee Jane, can you walk us through this chart again? I mean, it's a lot here and just what we're yes. trying to look at. Yeah, so the, the gray bars here are the measure of the liability. Uh, and so we've got uh, over a $4 billion liability, but as time goes on and people earn additional benefits, we expect that to grow. The uh, green and blue lines are the market value of assets and the actuarial value of assets. Uh, they've been very similar, um, but you'll see with the 20% return, the market value ends up being higher than the actuarial value because we're only recognizing a portion of that in, in developing our contributions. The funded status is shown at the top, and I'm showing this on a, based on the market value of assets. Sometimes we show it based on the actuarial value. But you can see we're um, projected to get to 100% funded in 20 years by 2040. Down this side, we're showing the assumed uh, investment returns each year, and so I put in 20% for the first year, but then 6.625 each year after that. And so the bottom chart is showing the contributions with the purple bars being the member contributions and the gold bars, the city's contributions. Um, we sometimes show this as a percent of pay. This chart is showing the dollar amounts. Um, and the red line is the projection from the 2020 valuation. So you can see how much it's changed since the 2020 valuation. Um, so now that the 2020 valuation set the contributions for the fiscal year end 2022. So that number does not change. We first get the changes starting in 2023 uh, and they, they gradually increase over time. The, uh, the black bar or line here is, is the normal cost. So that is the value of the benefits attributable to a year of service. And so all the contributions up to the black line are, are just paying for the benefits that are being earned. And the contributions above the black line are going to pay the unfunded liability. So if we were 100% funded, our contributions would be on the black line. Okay, so the black line is, if we were 100% funded, it would be on the black line. Yeah, because we Which would- Which is like 50 billion, I don't know, or 50 some odd over. Yeah, for the city, it'd be about, it, you know, in total, it's uh, somewhere around 70 million. Mm -hmm. 
So this is all of that contribution above that is, is what we're using to pay for the unfunded liability. And that's why bringing down that unfunded liability would have a significant impact uh, on future contributions. Mm -hmm. But is the black line what we pay now? Like just, I mean, what is needed to pay the the members that are retired? Yeah, or not? Uh, it's not the benefit payments. It's <laughs> the expected cost of the benefits earned in that year of service. So it's really for all the active employees. Okay. The benefits that they earn or are attributed to the next year, okay. about $70 million. So like for tier two, it's 2% 2 of whatever it would be, or tier <clears throat> one would be two and a half percent. Right, yeah. So it, it's the cost of those benefits that are earned in that year. Okay. And then the, the blue line is... Um, Where's the blue line? Oh, you mean at the top where the gray is? No, that, that's blue. Can you see my arrow, my pointer? The blue uh, line starts yeah, yeah. right up at the top and then it gradually oh, goes down. Blue. Yeah, yeah. So that line is the normal cost plus the interest on the unfunded liability. Hmm. So only the contributions above that blue line that are making the unfunded liability go down. We have to contribute to that blue line just to keep the unfunded liability where it is as a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so we call that tread water and we had just gotten the federated system above tread water. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I said there's not a whole lot of room for federated to adjust the contributions because we want to be above that tread water rate paying down. The return of 20% really lowers that tread water cost. So those contributions can go um, towards paying down the unfunded liability much more. Bill, if I may, and I think you may have mentioned this, but I think you always remind us, obviously this assume a 20% in 2021, but from there forward, not only we meet the assumed year return, but all the other assumptions are met as well. Yeah, exactly. which, which is extremely, extremely unlikely. <laughs> right. And yeah. but this is just for you. that we don't change any assumptions either. Yes, understood. Yes, thank you. I, I just wanted to make that point, right? So that is understood for right. everyone. Thank you. But this is kind of our, our median expectation going forward. There's a lot of variability around it, but this is kind of the, the median of what we'd expect going forward. Okay, one more question. Uh, the amortization payment growth rate, the 2.75, what is that? So um, when we set up an amortization, to pay off the unfunded liability, we have a whole bunch of layers, right? But each amortization, we set up a payment schedule and we set it up, unlike your mortgage where you pay the same dollar amount every year, we set it up where it increased, the payment increases each year by 2.75%. And the idea is that that will be close to uh, the same level of payroll or the same level of city's revenue, because you would expect revenue growth and payroll growth um, in somewhere um, from two and a half to 3%. So that's for the current city employees then, when you're talking about payroll? Yes. Okay. It assumes no uh, growth in active membership. So it's just if they, they keep the same number of employees mm -hmm. from year to year, mm -hmm. know, we're expecting payroll to growth grow. Um, we actually expect payroll to grow about 3% a year 
uh, yeah, the that's 25. the wage inflation, right? Right. And we set the 275 just below that so that the amortization payments um, won't be a larger percentage of payroll. Mm -hmm. Won't be as likely to be a larger percent of payroll. So that could be like step increases or um, MPPs or whatever. The well, the the wage inflation is really trying to capture the across the board increases. Uh, really? Yeah. And we hmm. the step increases we capture separately. It's just not a variable on here. It's not a variable on here because okay. Um, <laughs> when you look at it in aggregate, the step increases um, kind of end up coming out because you have people retiring and new hires coming in. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so I wanted to talk uh, about your role, the retirement board's role, and, and what options you have. So um, obviously, if you received uh, uh, POB assets, uh, one of the key things you have to do is decide how to invest them. I'm not here to talk about that because I'm not your investment advisor. Um, so I'm going to talk about the other aspects of what you have to do um, it, that we work with you on, which is to set the funding policy for the plan. So you determine how the contributions work for the city. And we want to make sure the benefits are secure and we try and balance between providing a stable pattern of contributions so the city can budget and they can be predictable uh, with some generational equity. So um, if, you, if you just wanted stable contributions, we'd have a really long amortization period because then the contribution amounts wouldn't change much. Um, but you'd be kicking the can to the next generation a lot. And so we have to shorten that up and try and balance those two competing objectives. The city pays whatever contribution the retirement board adopts. They have to. Um, and we develop the current policy anticipating regular annual contributions but we haven't specifically addressed what happens if we get a large lump sum that's financed by a bond. Uh, and so we need to decide what we wanna do. And in the city council meeting, the municipal advisor um, assumed that you would adopt a certain policy, uh, which is not your current policy, but uh, they assumed that you would adopt uh, a policy. And so it, it is something that we need to coordinate carefully with the city council so that um, expectations are met with the pension obligation bond and the city gets, um, gets what they're expecting in terms of contributions and how the risk gets passed through to them. And there are uh, I'm going to run through four potential methods, uh, three of which I categorized as traditional methods. They're kind of variations on the same. Uh, this third one is, is what the municipal advisor assumed you would do. Uh, but I'm going to suggest you also consider um, another method that would not change the city contributions initially and would only change them as uh, investment returns came in. So if under our current policies, if we just got a billion dollar POB or a $20 million or whatever excess contributions that we weren't expecting, we would treat that as an actuarial experience gain and provide a credit over a 20 year amortization with 2.75% increases each year. That's 
our normal amortization policy. And so that's what we would do. We wouldn't even look at what the terms of the POB were, whether the city issued a five-year POB or a 30-year POB or how their payments were structured. Um, and then we would change that credit whenever we change uh, our assumptions, the discount rate, uh, we could change the 2.75% uh, increase rate. We can even change the amortization period and change that. Um, but all the assets come in and are just treated as plan assets, smoothed over five years. Any gains or investment gains and losses are smoothed over five years and amortized over 20. So that's what our current policy would be. Um, so in, in my work where I've run into the POVs, both the, the issuer, uh, the, the employer, and the system have been interested in at least trying to match some of the terms of the POV to the way it's amortized so that they can uh, quantify their, their risks. Um, and so you can set up the plan amortization to match the same term of the POB. You could, uh, if they set up their payments to increase at 2% um, a year or to be level dollar, you could set up the credit uh, along the same way. Uh, and so that uh, eliminates some of the most risky approaches. Uh, you know, the worst case would be where you borrow over a long period and take the credit over a really short period. Um, but uh, it, it just matches the credit that the retirement plan is providing to the, the costs and the payments, uh, in the pattern of the cost and payments uh, for the POB. So if we look at this, um, Here's a, a new model for you to look at. So let me explain what's going on here. Uh, I'm using the pension parameters for amortization of a discount rate of 6.625, payment increase rate of 2.75, and amortization period of 20 years. I'm assuming, just for the illustration, that they can issue a POB at 3% interest and they structure it so the payments increase at 2.75 and over 20 years. So we've matched those terms and the only difference is, is the discount rate. And just for illustration, I did a billion dollar POB. Again, that's not to suggest the city is gonna do a billion dollar POB, but it's a round number. What you see here on the, the top is the green area is the pension payment for that billion dollars. So the amortization at 6.625 over 20 years. The blue is what the city would be paying uh, to pay off the POB. And so the, the credit for the green area is bigger than the blue area. So the bottom, we show a net contribution gain. So th this is saying in the first year, the city's contributions would be reduced by $20 million. When you take into account the reduction in the contribution to the pension plan, plus their offset by their payment to the POB. So are you following that? Okay, so the pension payment, can you just explain that again? I mean, what is that? So I understand. So in the first year, roughly, if we use this basic approach, we would reduce their contribution to the pension plan by about $70 million. But they would have to pay $50 million toward paying off the POB. Oh, OK. So we reduce their obligation by uh, so it's, it's close to 75, right? It is. 75 million. All right, so we reduce it by 75, more or less. But they still have to pay the 50. 
Right. So they get a net reduction of about 20 million. Okay. And then that it expands for each year. That assumes that we actually earn the 6.625 every year. Okay, so this is the pension payment that the sponsor makes to the plan, right? The pension payment it would be the green is the credit is is the pension payment if they're on that billion dollars if there was no POB, and the blue okay. is what they have to pay for the POB. And so they're replacing this green set of payments with the blue set of payments, and so they're getting a gain. Okay, so the whole green is basically what they're not paying because they gave us a billion dollars. Exactly. If you just put it in people talk. <laughs> and, and that assumes that we actually get the 6.6. The 6.6, 6. 6, yeah, because if we lower that, then that's going to be different or now that Brian's well, leaving. We actually achieve something different or lower. Yeah. So yeah. here now what I'm saying is what if they actually only earned 3%. What, what if the pension plan only earned 3% on the money that they gave us for the POB that they borrowed at 3%, right? That's kind of a net wash. Right. Um, but how would that change the, the pattern? Well, it wouldn't change anything at the start, but as we start having losses, for the 3% versus the 6.625, we would start increasing the city's contributions, which are represented by these gold bars. Mm -hmm. But that gets spread out because um, we recognize them over five years and then amortize, amortize over 20. Mm -hmm. And so those uh, still remain lower and build up over time and they're still paying them off out to 30 years. The net impact is they still come out ahead for the first 13, 14 years. And then they have to pay off that difference uh, in the last 15 years. So, so what's the total of that present value? I mean, if you take the bottom and- It, it, should, it should come out to the same because you're just giving them a credit up front and charging them later. Because mm -hmm. they, they borrowed money at 3% and earned 3% with that money. I think. But you're giving them a credit up front and then charging them. Uh, you're giving them a credit up front, assuming that you're gonna earn 6.625. Mm -hmm. And then because you didn't, Mm -hmm. You're charging them later to make up for that difference. Mm -hmm. And so it is a shift of the contribution pattern uh, to push it back in time. And you get a similar effect if we had 0% returns for five years. It, and then after that, we got our assumption. Uh, they still get uh, credit for a while, and then they pay for those investment losses at the end. So it really shifts the the impact of those uh, to much later in the future. Now, if we get good returns, so double our assumption, 13.25 for five years, uh, their gains compound, and, and it really reduces the city's contributions. So it's a significant, I mean, this is the scenario we all want, right? This is why you, you borrow money at the low interest rate and invest it and hope you get the, the good return. Um, and, and yeah, this is the payoff. So that's the basic dynamic with the traditional approaches. The version that the uh, city's municipal advisor suggested is a method that CalPERS uses, where the city decides what amortization base they want to pay off with the proceeds of the POV. And so they are effectively replacing 
the plan's payment schedule with the POB payment schedule for that, for whatever base they designate. That gives the city control over any of the mismatches um, they want. Um, they could potentially defer payments. Um, they can do a variety of things. And I think this is what's valuable in CalPERS is you have something like 3,000 different employers who are forced into the same contribution policy. And so this gives them some leverage to adjust that pattern of contributions to fit their needs. Um, but there are some risks because you could issue, the city could issue a 30 year POV to replace an amortization with only five years remaining. That'd give them a huge um, benefit up front, uh, but then they'd be paying for it for 25 more years. It's not as big a risk for federated because all of our amortizations have quite a bit of time left on them. Um, so I'm not as concerned with this uh, for federated as I might be for police and fire. But I also think we should be able to work with the city and figure out um, how to structure the, the payments and, and work that out because it's just one employer and, and one retirement system. It's not 3,000 different employers. Um, the other concern I have about this, and, and you see this like every week in the news articles uh, for the California employers is when it gets to the political level, it makes the POB look like they're just refinancing their debt um, at a lower interest rate. And that's not really what's going on because it's not a uh, hard debt. It's just a amortization payment schedule that we've set up. And, and so it, it makes it look like they're getting a guaranteed better deal when it's not guaranteed. Bill, would this only give them control of the, um, the, the pension obligation bond aspect of it, or does this now give them control of everything else where we set the contribution? No, it would only give them control of the pension obligation proceeds. Okay. So, so just to take a look at this, this is, I think we've, well, I know we've shown this before. These are the projected payments on tier one UALs. And so we have each um, each layer of the amortization set up as uh, a square where the gold ones are gains and losses, purple are assumption changes. And this mm -hmm. big blue one is the 2009 uh, UAL. And so what their method is saying is they could go in and say, well, I want to pay off this purple one, or I want to pay off this one. I think most likely they're going to be looking at the big 2009 UAL. So I don't think it's a, a huge risk um, for you, but they would essentially just if they paid off the whole 2009 UL, and I'm, I don't know that they're looking at that large of a payment, but if they paid off the whole 2009 UAL, you would just take this blue set of payments out of this chart and everything else would drop down uh, and the payments would be much lower. And then they'd have whatever their POB payments were uh, off on the side that would essentially be replacing that. Bill, if I could just just add one one comment here, sure. um, I just want to clarify. I, I I don't believe Calpers lets the employers have any control over the rate. So so there may be under the Calpers system the way it's set up, there may be different um, ways to direct an extraordinary contribution, um, and th that would be your blue lines there, and then that has an impact on on the rate. But the system sets the rate, not the, you know, it, it, it's not like they're surrendering control 
um, to the sponsor to then kind of figure out what the next 20 plus years are going to look like. So I just want to make that clarification. It, well, no, the yeah. CalPERS has their, um, their policy that sets out how they calculate the rate. What this lets them do with a POB is say, I want all of my POB proceeds to go exactly this UAL piece, which eliminates that piece of the, the contribution projection. Okay, so, so they could choose how they want it utilized. They can't choose how the payment. We're not changing works. the CalPERS policies, but okay. in effect, they can by doing that mm -hmm. they can, um, affect the pattern of their contributions. Okay, Th think of it like this. So if the sponsor takes in the POB proceeds, the sponsor's holding those and can do in theory, theory whatever the sponsor wants. Um, so once those proceeds go into the plan, now they become plan assets and the sponsor no longer has any control over them. But, but what Bill's pointing out is that under the CalPERS system, it's that decision point that happens when the sponsor is contributing the amounts to the plan. The sponsor is saying, I want this extraordinary amount that we got from the POB proceeds to go to X or I want it to go to Y. And then that has certain results once it's in the plan that changes things as you can see on this chart. But it's not as if sponsor contributes it to the plan and then decides after that what it's all going to look like. So I just wanted to, to, to clarify that when we were talking about control. Right. Sorry. That's that's right. Clarification. It, 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 there is, there's something comparable to this where they have a full pattern uh, set by CalPERS and what CalPERS is letting them do is just pay off individual pieces of it. Okay. So, I mean, the, the big issue would be, you, you know, what if this 2009 UAL only had five years left on it? They could issue a 30 year bond and say, I want to pay off the five year one, which would have a significant reduction in their, their uh, contribution to CalPERS, and then their POB payments would extend for 30 years. So um, I, I'm not suggesting that San Jose is contemplating that. I know they're not. So it, it's not, um, it, I'm just talking about the, the dynamic that you get into if you, uh, if you just give, set up that policy, which I think does make sense when you're dealing with 3,000 different employers. But when you have just one employer you're dealing with, you can have a conversation and work out what's the right structure to, to do. Because these are all under the retirement board's control and we can change these at any time. They're just, um, they're just the results of our current policy. And this is just the illustration of an extreme case where um, they took a, a 10 year payment. So we, we do have some 10 year payments that they could do this with and extend over 30 years. And it gives them a credit essentially for the first 10 years. And then the, they have the remaining payments on the POB for the 20 years after that. So, it, it, it could be used. I don't think the city's looking at doing this at all, but it could be used uh, to give you short-term relief and, and higher contributions down the road, which is part of the balancing item that the board considers all the time is how, how much do we want to charge the city now and how long do we want to spread those contributions over. So there's definitely overlap. So all of those traditional methods have some advantages. Uh, and it's not to say that you shouldn't um, do those. You need to be aware of what those dynamics are. Um, the piece that, that bothers me the most about them is that they all provide a short-term incentive to issue a POB, which as long as 
the city's really aware of and, and doing the analysis, um, that's fine. Um, but we are effectively crediting the city in advance for the difference between what we expect to earn and the interest rate on the POB. And then we make up for it later to true up the difference between our expected return and our actual returns. Um, and so often what I see is this short-term incentive kind of overrides the analysis of the actual risks, the underlying economic risks uh, that add leverage to the city's contributions. And, and really uh, focuses them on their short-term cash budget uh, changes rather than the uh, dynamics of borrowing at a low rate and, and investing it for the long term in a way that you think you can get a higher return. So to counter that, uh, we propose consideration of a, a method that would eliminate that short-term incentive. And, and effectively, well, we go through some mechanics here, but effectively the uh, city's reduction to the pension contribution when they issue a POB would exactly equal the amount they're gonna pay on the POB so that their total payment initially would still be the same. They'd be contributing less to the pension, but the difference would be just exactly what they pay to the POB. Then when we actually earn more or less than 3%, the, the interest rate on the POB, then we adjust the, the credits and they get the benefits uh, of the investment returns. And uh, so let me just show you the, the dynamics. In the, the basic situation, if we earn 6.625% each year, we'd start out, they'd have the POB payment, but we'd charge them a payment so that their total payment matched what, they, what it would have been without the POB. But as we earn those 6.625 returns, that payment goes down and they effectively get the credit. So it, it, in essence, it defers the credit or the POB until they actually until we actually earn the investment returns that create a gain. If we only earn three percent, their payments, total payments, including the POB, would be exactly the same as if they didn't issue the POB. So they borrowed money at 3%, we earned 3%. Um, the payments would be the same. There's no net gain or loss between issuing the POB or not issuing the POB. Again, if you get, uh, if you have poor investment returns initially, uh, we start charging them right away. So they actually have to start paying for those investment losses. And then when they start, when we start earning the 6.625, they get the benefits. And so they would get the benefit over the long term. Um, but they help shore up the system with the zero returns at the beginning. And if they get the good returns, uh, it just accelerates these credits. And so they get substantial credits as they earn the good, as we earn the good returns. Um, so it's just a way of saying, we're not gonna give you the credit for the difference between the, what we're assuming and what you're borrowing at until we actually earn it. So once, once we earn it, we'll give you that uh, credit. Uh, but until then, we're going to keep sort of your total contributions uh, the same 
which compared to the traditional method means we'd be charging the city um, more and getting more into the plan. I think the municipal advisor uh, referred to that as kind of recycling the savings. And they talked about that that's one mechanism that the city should consider is not, not taking all of those savings to their budget, but uh, increasing their contributions. Um, this effectively just uh, formalizes that in, in a process and says, we're gonna do it, uh, but credit the savings when they actually earn the investment returns. Bill, I think um, Vice Chair Horowitz had a question. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes. Um, and first of all, thanks for this comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. It's quite uh, informative. The, your proposed solution there on the previous slide, uh, which is certainly seems to be the most conservative, uh, your proposed method, I was gonna ask if you have a name for it so that we can refer to it. And it sounds like you were saying the city uh, presentation called it recycling of savings. Is that, or how would you refer to this? Just so we can can give it a name other than Bill's proposed method. Um, I, I haven't named it, um, but uh, we can think about that and certainly think about uh, incorporating that recycling concept into the name. Um, so Bill, has other municipalities done what you're proposing here? I, uh, the, I, I know the state of Illinois actually has this embedded in their, has something very similar embedded in their contribution policy. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to refer to their contribution policy because in many other yeah. respects, it's not a good contribution policy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they do have it, have something really similar embedded in theirs. Any of the other California, and because there were a bunch that in California had pension obligation bonds, right? Right, uh, I, I believe most of those are with CalPERS. And uh, And Who did the, the city use? Who's their, um, you were mentioning, uh, their, the consultant they used? Uh, the name's escaping me at the moment. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I probably should know too, if that was in these meetings. And I think they do do a lot of consulting with the CalPERS system. Oh, okay. Is, is it MRC, Bill? Municipal Resource Group? I don't think that's correct. But... Okay. Yeah, I think you generically referred them to them as municipal consultant. Right. Yeah. So I... Okay, that's okay. Bill, you know, in that proposed method, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I fully understand it, but if the returns are low and the payments are low, does that it, does that suggest then that there are I, idle, quote unquote, idle bond proceeds that are held on the city side? No, I should be clear about that. Um, the description here, I, I think you're looking at um, some of the wording here about subtracting the POB balance and stuff. Mm -hmm. All yeah. of the POB proceeds are invested. It's only when we're determining contributions, we go through uh, some maneuvers in order to accomplish this. Result. Okay, so and the bond proceeds- treating it like a contingency reserve that we take out, but then we also take out the uh, city's payments on that contingency reserve. Okay, thank you. Great. And I'm sorry, I think you had three more slides or so. Uh, I think that was uh, just getting to the conclusions here that, you know, 
we don't have to worry about this because it's the city's decision, but from their perspective and looking at their contributions, it's similar to adding the, the leverage and they should really focus on um, the dynamic of borrowing at a low interest rate and uh, trying to achieve a higher return. I'm concerned if they're making a decision to create that leverage just in order to alter the contribution patterns because we can do that without creating the leverage. Um, maybe not to the full extent they'd like, but we should have uh, some, con some consultation and back and forth with the retirement boards if that's what's motivating the decision. So I know you have other questions, uh, Chair Castellano. Let me just quickly, uh, the, the, again, as I introduce this item, out of the uh, retirement working group, the goal is to improve the health and sustainability of the plan. So, so if that is the basic premise, you would think that it will be a collective thought to do what's best for, best for the plans, obviously. Uh, although clearly, you know, there is implications for the city budget. So I, I don't want to be naive about that, but I'm hoping that that's really the main issue. I just want to let you know, there was a question asked and city staff was nice enough to let me know that their name of the consultant is Urban Futures Inc. Okay. UFI is the municipal advisor. Yes, Urban Futures. Um, and yeah, I want to emphasize that there's no decisions today. We wanted this just to get on your plate so that you can be thinking about it, thinking about the dynamics and to help prepare for uh, joint meetings with the city. Uh, I do think whatever direction we go and whatever direction the city goes, it, it's helpful if, if we can coordinate and understand what, you know, we, we have our separate decisions to make, but it, it's good to and be aware of what the objectives are on each side and, and how they're approaching it. So hopefully this gives you kind of um, a baseline level to start engaging in that conversation and think about um, what we would want to do as the retirement board, uh, depending on what the city's wanting to do. Obviously, if they're going to give us $20 million, it's different than if they're going to give us a billion dollars. So yeah. <laughs> a lot of questions um, still unanswered from the city side. Uh, and, and my understanding, and I'm sure your justice is aware, that they plan to do it, I think they plan to do it in segments. Like, so mm -hmm. let's say they went out for a pension of a billion, then they would, you know, break it into maybe five segments and, and or go after them at that point, get the, the right for a billion, but then go after it in individual segments. Right. So they might go 200 million a year for five years or something yeah. like that, which, um, so again, we would want to look at how we're going to handle that mm -hmm. our end, uh, for each of those five years. And again, yeah. I, I, I also understand that, I mean, I think with Mayor Licardo, I mean, with our unfunded liability just slightly over 50% for federated. You know, we are one of the lowest, you know, cities and um, trying to get that to be higher. Um, also, I think it impacts when they do go after bonds because it, it's harder to borrow with that lower amount. So all of the above, you know, I think is what's driving that. That's I'd add a couple comments to what Trustee Jennings is saying around um, the retirement uh, solutions working group. So this is a little bit dated because we basically disbanded that group. But they, the city broadly, some of the team on the finance side, did a presentation around the POBs, maybe several now at this point. And I did appreciate the fact that they were looking at their credit rating and going through sort of the thought process, thought processes as we are. Um, I think, thank you, Bill, for this uh, really comprehensive report. And I think the punchline is really the last line. That, <laughs> that to me is the most valuable, which is, as I think through this, 
how I, I'm, it's unclear because again, it's new. So it's some kind of conversation that we need to be having uh, with staff and with the right folks at the city, sort of the preparatory uh, dialogue so that at minimum we can address any assumptions, uh, you know, valid or otherwise. Uh, and there's no sort of a right and wrong. It's more of, we can get to the end point, but there are multiple pathways. And so it's just some of that, um, just how that dialogue can be kicked off. Um, I'd be really interested to do, to either participate or help shape. Um, so you're absolutely right, trustee, or right on the money. Uh, I mean, this is very helpful. Um, I think Kyron does great, great work. The good news, I mean, I can't emphasize enough, I think what trustee or said and, and the last two bullet points in here, right? Uh, so it's intended to help prepare the board for a joint meeting with the city council and decisions should be coordinated with the city so there are no surprises. I wanna be clear uh, and I wanna put a context and I defer to, to council, coordinated, you have your responsibilities with the plans. That's your fiduciary responsibility. The city has their own responsibility. Coordinated from the standpoint, as trustee or indicated, we want to be transparent and, and provide meaningful information so that everyone can make informed decisions. That is, that's the coordination part of it, not about coordination to making decisions. You have your own responsibilities, the city have theirs. So that has to be pretty clear. The good news is, again, tentatively, there's a joint meeting on the 30th that allows you board to entertain a number of meetings before September, one in August, one in September, you still wanna hear from your investment consultant. Uh, you also want to possibly hear uh, from your uh, fiduciary uh, uh, council. I mean, aside from the, the presentations by, by, by Chiron and the investment consultants where they will certainly comment, maybe a presentation by themselves. Uh, but I think um, I can assure you, and I know the city staff right now listening to the presentation, although they're not joining the discussion, but they certainly can if they would like to. Uh, we stand ready, we as in our office, Prabhu and I, and the rest of the staff, to work, and we do, uh, with, uh, and I coordinate a lot with the finance director, Julia Cooper, and the budget director on, on issues for the POB, because we want to make sure that we are clear, there are no surprises, we ask the right questions. Um, and, uh, and, and I think about anything else, we want to make sure that we prepare you to be ready with the right education. Today was actuarial, next month may be invest, I'm sorry, August may be investments, September may be investments, actuarial and council. Point being is that we are ready at the September uh, meeting, joint meeting with the city council so that we can answer questions of questions that they have. Now, by the same token, to the extent possible, and just like I, can, we cannot speak, Prabhu and I cannot speak for the board, city staff cannot speak for city council. But I think as, as Bill indicated, it would be helpful if we have a sense of some of the ranges that they're thinking about, because there's a difference if they are gonna be issuing 50 million versus 500 million or a billion dollars, right? They have different implications. There's a different discussion that we have to have that there's a different challenge on deploying that money from the investment standpoint. Of obviously, I defer to Prabhu on that, who is, has a lot more uh, information and knowledge in that area. But suffice to say, this is just the kickoff. There's more work to be done. And I'm really looking uh, to you, Boar, for um, um, questions uh, and, and in terms of needs that you want us to bring forward to coordinate with you consultants so that we can get you as ready as possible for those meetings. Thank you, Roberto. So I, I do have questions, but I would I'd really um, prefer to give other trustees a opportunity to ask questions or make comments first. Yeah, I have uh, another question for Bill. You commented that the city does not need to take on this leverage just to alter the contribution pattern. So I wanted to confirm we can provide that change of contribution pattern chiefly through the amortization schedule and the discount rate or other, other levers as well. Uh, it, it'd be chiefly through the amortization uh, method. The discount rate obviously also has an effect. Um, 
but what I'm thinking is the amortization schedule is really your policy on the pattern of contributions to get back to 100% funded. And you can control what that pattern is. We still want to get back to 100% funded and we want to assess the risks to the system. So it's not, um, it's not un <laughs> uncontrolled. They can't just say, well, we want to reduce contributions by 50%, um, but there is room uh, to adjust that pattern. Uh, and so we, that's what I'm suggesting is we should have that conversation if that's what's driving it and make sure we've addressed what we can uh, what we're comfortable with um, through the amortization policy before they um, issue a POB just to affect the contribution pattern. I think it, it's it's much different. You know, it, they're, they're obviously looking at the low cost of borrowing right now and the potential for the investment returns. And, and I, I just, want them to focus on that dynamic in making this uh, decision. There are entities that are very poorly funded where I think they may be uh, also taking into account, um, you know, a, a pattern of contributions. Thank you. I just wanted to understand what our key levers are. And it sounds like number one is the amortization schedule. Yeah. I did have some comments in response to what uh, CEO Pena just said about what we would like to see, but I'll, I'll defer those in case other trustees have questions they want to ask about today's presentation. Okay, thank you. Other questions and comments? Nothing further from, from me at the moment, thank you. Okay, thank you, Trustee Orr. And nothing from me. Nothing further from me. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Bill, I, I like like um, Rachel. I think you you folks do a great job, and I, I I really appreciate that your slides. You know, you speak to the lay people, and um, uh, the graphics are the graphics are really um, easy to digest. And I appreciate the fact that you used your mouse to get our eyes right onto the right spot of the slide. So, thank you for all of that. I'm sure that's part of why you guys are a successful uh, company. And to the extent that you're going to name that um, proposed method, you should do it fast because I think Stephen is. Uh, I see Stephen; he's ready to uh, trademark that himself. <laughs> um, Remember but, the old uh, thing: to to name something is to own it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but all kidding aside, though, Bill, thank you very much. Um, so my my question though is probably more process oriented and uh, something for uh, Bill slash. Jenny slash um, Roberto, but um, look, I think Bill, what what you what you presented, I think I understand it uh, for whatever that means. I, I so I'm, I'm good on that. My question is really thinking about thirtieth, Roberto. You know, there's will we'll be asked questions, and it, it, I guess it all depends really on what the council is looking to achieve on that date or by that date, but. To the extent they are really looking to move forward soon thereafter, and they have questions for us, um, you know, what my question is: what What do we need to have in place in order to respond to those questions? So, I mean, worst worst case scenarios, council has some questions about investments or the strategy that, um, you know, or what what are the other variables we might play with. Um, you know, the, um, the five year rolling, the amortization, et cetera, et cetera. And then to have Roberto answer, answer that question and then have me or any other trustee go, well, I don't agree with that. That doesn't make sense. I mean, we, we would want to be on the same page. We'd want to have those answers from the federated board grounded in, I would think we'd want to have those answers grounded in prior action or prior discussion from the board. But I don't know what those questions are. Again, I, I feel like I'm okay up to the point of today. I don't what, know what's next. So I don't know what those ne next questions might be. Um, and you know, it, it, maybe it's still another process. What do we need to do to think about what what might be coming next? What policies um, 
or again, discussions do we need to have in place so that whenever that we're asked the questions, we all as a, as a federated team have the same answers. Now, if the city has uh, that September 30th meeting and they're just saying, well, this is just the meeting to get the questions on the table, that's fine. But if they're really looking to move forward after September 30th, you know, we have a process to go through. We can't just answer all answer questions willy nilly on September 30th. We need to have some, and given the fact that we don't have a July meeting, we have an August and then a September meeting for that, and that, you know, two meetings before September 30th is really not a lot of time to get that kind of stuff done if it's if it's policy that needs to be um, codified. So yeah, that, that's really my concern, but I don't really know what's gonna be coming down the road here. Um, so yeah, Chair yes, go ahead. Castellano, let, let me first, let me take the first shot at responding to your comments or questions. A couple of things. Um, September 30th is, is, is not set in stone. There is a possibility that have to be defer to a further day. Um, I think the question that you're asking is something that I think the city staff and ourselves in the office has been thinking about. The way I envision this happening is, for example, at a joint meeting, I fully expect to have Chiron and our investment consultants available, perhaps even with a presentation. Uh, I also expect, and again, the city staff, and I know they just listening, but they certainly can comment, that we will work closely with each other to make sure that we will be ready at that meeting to address the concerns, uh, presumably, on the one hand from city council, but on the other hand from the boards. So the city staff can answer those questions and then our consultants can answer the questions that, they, that the city council have. So you're absolutely right. Um, I, it's a long process. Even after that, I don't foresee the city being able to issue any bonds until sometime in 2022. So this is not, this doesn't really happen, um, uh, you know, relatively quickly, it takes time. Uh, but you're right. I think the key issue here is to really be ready to have a meaningful meeting. And that means to go into the meeting with the tools and information that both bodies are looking for. And that will mean to me, and again, I know the city staff listening, and if you want to comment, feel free. It will be upon staff to make sure that we know what are the key issues that both bodies are looking to address so that we stand ready to address them in front of both bodies so that you get the information that you need. Uh, the city to be able to answer questions for the boards and vice versa, vice versa uh, our st uh, staff from the office and our consultants to answer questions from the city council. And, and you're right, uh, we are a team uh, and I wanna complicate matters, but it's just not federated. We have to make sure that federated and police right. and fire are working right. together. And you're right, this is why I always start some of my comments in public, making it very clear that I don't speak for the boards because yes, there may be a situation where, you know, the boards may think differently than me and that's fine. Um, but you're right. Uh, now that said, could there be some issues at the joint meeting that will come up that we haven't thought about? Sure. That may even require a second joint meeting. I do not know what's going to transpire, but rest assured that we will work with the city staff as closely as possible to make sure that we try to provide everyone the information that is that it, that will be needed at that meeting. And that means to me that I fully expect Bill Homer to be available, Mikita to be available, Varus to be available, myself, Prabhu, and from the city staff whatever city consultants they think or deem necessary as, as well as the city staff. Uh, so it, it will be a long meeting, but uh, you know, it will be coordinated as, as well as possible. Yeah, thank you, Roberto. I, yeah, that, that, that does get to my concerns, especially hearing 2022 might be more realis realistic and that you're being as mindful as, as, I'm, as I am, I think about um, orchestrating as much as possible in advance of uh, Something and, and just for a moment, I saw Mr. S uh, Nikolai Sklarov from the finance form turn his cameras on it. I don't know; I, he may have been wanting to say the same thing as you did from a city perspective, but uh, it's not there now. I, I think um, Nikolai. Yeah, go ahead. 
Oh, I, I was going to um, offer a return to uh, Vice Chair Horowitz next. Right, thanks. Well, following exactly on what you, uh, Chairman, have said about next steps and what we need to know, and, and probably I'm sure the CEO and CIO have already thought of this. In today's presentation, there's one simplifying assumption uh, that uh, we need to consider, and that is uh, where we look at the returns going forward just being flat in a flat line at six and five eighths or 3% going forward. And of course, the reality is it's gonna bounce all around up and down. So I would think a similar analysis, uh, but using a Monte Carlo uh, a methodology that reflects the real experience of returns that we could anticipate over the next uh, 20 years would be more appropriate to, and I presume that's something that our investment advisors would be able to supply as that, that's not something that the actuaries would do. So th that type of analysis I think would further inform us. Yeah, I, I think I, we would rely on the investment consultants for the um, the standard de deviation or distribution of returns, and then we can plug it in to our model to look at what impact that has on contributions. Okay. I would just add that, that I think there also needs to be a discussion around some of the legal issues that come into play. So, I mean, I think what what's been so helpful here among many things is to give you a flavor of what could be done and then what that would look like um, under various scenarios in the future and what that would mean for the city so so you're you're, you're walking away kind of knowing what you could do but the the next conversation is, you know, why you do it. And I think that's where that sensitivity that Roberto was referring to earlier in terms of coordination, um, roles and duties and the bases for your decision is going to be very important in this context. Um, one, for the reason Bill said of, of there not being any surprises to the city, the system, the bondholders, the members, um, but, but also so that, you know, everybody's kind of respecting the various different roles they play in this. And, and I think it's a little more, the legal issues are maybe a little more complex than, um, than they seem at first blush. So, you know, now that we have worked through the actuarial piece, I would suggest that we also spend a little bit of time um, kind of thinking about the legal issues and, and I'd be happy to kind of highlight what I think those are, we could come back, but I do think that would be um, valuable to the board in terms of the, the preparation and the education you need so that the, you'll end up with, with the actuarial, the investment and the legal points of view. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, other questions or comments? on this presentation today, as Bill mentioned, no decisions today. And then I guess we will, I'm sure we will come back and have something on the August agenda to take another step forward in, in you know, preparation process. Bill, thank you and your team again. Great job today. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. All right, so uh, let's go back to the agenda and um, we are we we covered pretty much everything, but I do want to uh, take a moment to uh, look at the future agenda items one more time. And Mr. Pena had something for us there. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So um, as a future item, and I don't know, I think we have either the your August meeting, the September meeting. I think one of the issues that we mentioned during my oral report, uh, and if it was me or someone else. I think it was actually Jenny, I'm not sure. Ah, you in the audience today, I believe, that the the governor extended the ability to have remote meetings through September 30th. And that's still the case. What that means to me is that we can, uh, your August and September board meetings most likely will be held remotely. Now, I don't want to speak for the city. I think they are looking to try to have when I said the city, I mean the city council to have their meeting in attendance sooner than that. I don't know if it's a hybrid approach or what, 
but I think that we should consider bringing an action item or discussion item with direction to your August or September meetings to talk about future meetings after September 30th. Uh, it, it is pretty straightforward if the flexibility afforded by the extension of the legal requirement after September 30th is terminated, then obviously you will not have the flexibility having to go meetings. So that would not require any further discussion. That means for the October meeting, we have to start our way back to uh, City Hall. Now, if somehow either that flexibility is extended or somehow the law is amended to allow more flexibility, and as I'm saying this, I'm looking at Jenny, to allow sort of for like in attendance, but also remote, which still happens, but it has a lot of requirements today where some trustees that feel comfortable attending physically can be in City Hall, but those that still do not feel comfortable could show up remotely. Ideally, if we have a technology, you will be at City Hall and then your face will be in one of those screens that we have in City Hall. If we can, if we can actually work that out, you know, if the law allows for that, that may be an option. Uh, and even if the law allows for continued remote work, I still, as a CEO, would like to hear based on whatever changes are happening in the state and COVID-19 from the, from the board as to your um, comfort and willingness to, uh, at some point, divert from remote meetings to meetings in attendance. So that, I think I, what I'm suggesting is to bring forward uh, an item for you either August or September meeting to discuss that. Yes, I agree. I agree. I would. Uh, um, I like that idea because I know city members, just like you said, Roberto, in the beginning when you gave your, uh, you know, all departments are looking at, you know, and taking surveys and seeing what is what is what, and um, the hybrid model is being put forward. Uh, side letters are being put forward as well with the unions as to employees and. Um, what they would be doing. So, um, and I know I enjoy doing the remote access. So, yes. so do I. <laughs> I would just point out, I think this goes without saying, but, um, you know, compared to, to, to employment where you have a lot of flexibility to maybe create new policies and things, um, you know, we're very limited in terms of what can be done. So if the governor's order expires, as it's said to, I mean, it really is, it's pretty impossible to do what you're doing now because each board member would have to be in a location that the public can attend and post it and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, so, you know, more to come, it, 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 it seems like certainly the governor is not the legislature. So this emergency order can't last forever. Um, but I guess I say all that to say, I'd be kind of surprised if we don't see something uh, at some point, um, because certainly you're not gonna be the only public body that isn't necessarily ex want, wanting to return to 100%, um, you know, in a physical location together. Yes. Uh, on the plus side, when we do go back physically, you will all get lunch. Very <laughs> healthy, very healthy, and uh, and uh, and tasteful lunch. Yeah. Except the special However, is out also, of business now. I mean, so as long as we cannot mandate that people are vaccinated, then most likely you have people wearing masks. You know, and it will be harder to understand people just because. Well, unless they, they speak fluently like myself, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roberto. I, I, I agree. I think everyone agrees we ought to have that. Uh, we ought to agendize that. Yes. All right. Okay. Um, and um, we did public retiree comments uh, once. Anything else? I think we're, we're, looks like we're, I think we're good on that. All right, and if there's nothing else for the good of the order, we're adjourned. Uh, 
I wanted to, yes, we are adjourned, but before we adjourn, Mr. Chair, uh, as, I'm, as you were adjourning the meeting, staff reminded me, which we have to consider that sometime back, the board made a decision that the September meeting was no longer going to be a general meeting and it was going to be somewhat of a retreat kind of meeting. Uh, I haven't thought about that. And so uh, that's not to say that we cannot have that item be brought to the September meeting. We may retreat to really have a lot of educational presentations on POBs. Uh, but in any case, I just wanted you to rem remind you of that, that uh, a couple of years back, you board selected not to have a your regular general meeting in September and instead use it for other issues, which it appears that it may be helpful to use this year's September meeting for further education on POBs besides okay. Agos. But in any case, just wanted to let you know and thank you, staff, for reminding me. We do have um, a, a meeting afterwards uh, for the uh, governance committee meeting. Uh, and so I don't know whether once we adjourn, uh, we just give five minutes and then try to kick off the governance meeting uh, at 12.30 for those of you that have to join that meeting. I think so. we have to, I think we have, the governance committee has to log out and then log into a separate link. Um, okay. Can staff tell me? That is, that is correct. correct. Yes, thank you. Okay, good. That's what I thought. It looked like it was a separate link. Oh, so that's at 12.30? Yes. I don't know. I, I think that that could be a good time. So anyway, I, I know people have to go, so I don't want to continue delaying the meeting. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we All should right. probably go back around 12.30. All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. Good to Thanks. see you Thank all. Thank you. Okay. All Thank right. you all. Thanks. Bye.